What's going on guys? Welcome back to Codiversity and in today's video we're going to be doing a crash course in OpenAI's API, specifically GPT-4 as well as DALI-3 for images. In this tutorial, we're going to be building out an app, as you can see right here on the screen. This app will generate AI content for you, specifically text and images as well. If you're not subscribed to this channel, please make sure you do that and hit the bell icon below to stay notified, as well as to like this video. So with that being said, you already know the intro. All right, as I mentioned, we're going to be using Next.js to build our front-end application as well as Tailwind CSS for some of our styling. And we're going to be using the OpenAI GPT-4 and DALI-3 versions to generate text and images respectively. So these are the newest versions as of the time of this video. So by the time you guys get ready to see this video or maybe sometime in the future, these versions may be updated again but you can pretty much follow along to work with GPT-4 as well as DALI-3. So before we jump into some of the coding, I'm going to demonstrate how this app works. So as you can see here, this is an AI content generator. What I can do here is, is for example, I can select here text <clears throat> under this uh, selection here, and then I can just give it a simple prop. So I want it to, for example, give me a funny joke about cats. And once I click generate, it's going to generate this text for me, this funny joke. So if you can think about this as being sort of like a chat GPT clone, this is essentially how it works. It's just that we're being more specific regarding the instructions we're giving it. So as you can see here, we have this funny joke. Um, whether you find it funny or not, that's up to you. Uh, it may be rather corny, but nonetheless, you see that it works. And likewise, I can come here and I can select images or image. And I can say, for example, <clears throat> let's do something cool. Let's say Brooklyn Bridge. Now, one thing I'll point out while this is generating, this may take quite a bit of time, but one thing I'll point out here is that some of the images that it generates may not be pinpoint accurate with the actual object. For example, in this case, I'm giving Brooklyn Bridge and the image generated may not be exactly like the Brooklyn Bridge or may not look exactly like it. But as you can see here, it's pretty darn close. And I am a New Yorker, so I can say it's pretty close. And this is the power of DALI 3, guys. I'm actually using version 3 here. I'm not using version 2. And so the images are quite sharper. Uh, things work a lot faster on the back end to generate these images on the fly. So it looks pretty darn good. I might even end up using this at some point. So, you know, enough with that. Enough said with that. Let's go ahead and start building out this app right away. So the first thing we want to do here is, is generate a new API key on OpenAI. And the way to do that is to go to platform.openai.com. And once you reach here, sign up for a brand new account. It's completely free to sign up. The only thing you'll have to pay for is the actual API usage. So go ahead and sign up on this platform and follow the instructions and then confirm via email your account. And after you do that, you'll be here, you'll land here at platform.ai, sorry, platform.openai.com and you'll see the dashboard here. And essentially what we wanna do is generate a new API key. So what we're gonna do here is on the left, there's a gear icon. So if I hover over that, uh, and then I select here API keys, it'll take me to this uh, screen here. And what we want to do is we want to create new secret key. So let's click that button here and let's go ahead and create one. We'll call it Open AI Crash Course. So once I create that, you'll see that it's gonna generate a brand new um, API key for us. Now, guys, I'm going to use this API key for this tutorial. It'll definitely be deleted by the time you see this video, so don't try to use my API key at all. Uh, you, it won't work. Uh, so, you know, just putting that out there just so you can know that. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and I'm going to click done. We're gonna store this on the side so that we have this um, later on because we're going to include this in a .env file within our project. So next, what I want to do is create a brand new folder on my computer where I can store my Visual Studio Code project. So to do that, I'm just going to open up my prompt window here. Cool. And let me just drag that over here. Cool. So 
first let me just navigate to the folder where I want to store it I'll store it in development projects and I'm going to make a new directory by typing in mkdir and let's call this openai dash crash and hit enter and now let's cd into that new folder and after we do that I'm going to type code and then a dot that's going to open up Visual Studio Code in that directory. Great, so now we have Visual Studio Code open. So now I want to create a brand new Next project. So let's go ahead and close a few of these tabs here. And right now I just have an empty folder, as you know, because I only created the directory so far. So let's go ahead and create a new Next project. I'm on a Mac, so I'll be using a lot of Mac uh, shortcuts as well as Mac menus, but they work similarly to Windows, and I'll try to point it out wherever I can, if possible. So the very first thing I want to do is open up a new integrated terminal within Visual Studio Code. So I'll just click on Terminal at the very top, and then select New Terminal. And that's going to open up a brand new command line for me to use. So in, in here, I'm going to type out a command now. In order to make this work, guys, I want you guys to go and look at some of my videos on the channel uh, because um, you'll need to have Node.js installed, preferably the newest version, which, which at the time of this video is version 21.x or dot .something. I don't know what the build number is. But go ahead and install the newest version of Node.js um, and make sure that it comes with NPM, MPX, and NVM. And the reason why we want those uh, package manager, uh, the package manager and the other plugins to be included is just to ensure that we're able to run the proper commands here in the terminal. Maybe look online for further instructions on how to do that. I won't cover it here because it'll be too long. So let's go ahead and type out this command. Once you have Node.js installed, let's type npx space create dash next dash app at symbol and we want to install the latest so we're going to type out here latest space and then a dot to install in the current directory at the time of this video next js 14 just was just released so um i did have a few issues when running this um locally prior but, but i think i've resolved those issues so i'll try my best to get through this hopefully with no hiccups but i just hit enter and now it's going to run me through a series of questions so first it's going to ask me if I want to use TypeScript. We're going to keep things nice and simple and say no. Now it's asking me if I want to install ESLint. We'll say no here to that. We'll say yes to Tailwind CSS because we're going to use this for styling. We're going to say no to the source directory. We will say yes to the app router, which is the new way of using the app folder uh, within Next.js. And we'll also say no to this. So now, as you can see here on the far left, there is a new folder structure that was created here after I ran that command. And Rick, we can go through some of these files very briefly. So in my other videos, I've already showed you what makes up or what a Next.js project consists of. On a very high level, we have a few configuration files here that's made up of JSON, JSON being JavaScript object notation. So for example, if we look at this JS config file here, this JS config.json, just has some JSON here to con um, configure the paths um, related to this Next.js file. So uh, we won't be touching that at all. I'll just open up here this uh, package.json, this one right here. And this is a very important file because whatever we install in terms of plugins, extensions, whatever have you, will be uh, showing in here. So it's going to basically show up as a dependency within our project. And so we just, you know, want to show, I'm just going to show here what we have. We already have Next installed. And being that Next is a subset of React, that's installed automatically for us. And as you can see, we're using Next version 14.0.2 at the current moment. So again, we're not going to touch this file directly. Um, there will be other files that we'll create within the app folder. So I'll jump to the app folder and show you what we have so far. So if I expand that folder, as you can see here, we only have a fab icon, which we don't really need to be concerned about for this tutorial. We have this globals.css file, and this is basically our main style file that we'll be using here to uh, uh, create some of the styling that we'll see in the app. So what I'm going to do here, since I'm already in here, is I'm just going to get rid of a lot of this uh, boilerplate code. So from line four all the way down, I'm just going to delete that, and I'll save. So as of right now, we'll have no styling. All we'll have at the very top 
from lines one to three are directives, um, which are part of the Tailwind CSS framework. And these directives we'll use to establish layers uh, within the style file that we can use to style some of our elements on the page. So <clears throat> the very next thing here we have is the layout.js file. I'm just gonna go ahead and rename that to layout.jsx because generally I like to rename any kind of um, React or Next components as .jsx. So that way we can differentiate between a regular like React or Next component and a uh, standard .javascript file or .js file. So I'm just gonna uh, click that and hit enter. And I'm just going to put an X at the end to rename that to layout.jsx. So in this file here, <clears throat> what we have is basically the shell of our application. This layout.jsx will basically uh, be the parent layout for the entire application. So any styling or elements that we put here will be shared with the entire application. We'll come back to this file shortly because we're gonna do some minor changes here. We're gonna move on to this page.js file and we're gonna just rename that to page.jsx as well. And this is still gonna work um, regardless if we call it .js, .jsx, or if we were using typescript.ts or .tsx is going to work. But within this page.jsx file, this is basically our home page. And you'll see shortly what will come up once we run this application. This is going to be the HTML or the JSX rather that will get rendered to the, uh, to the view. Okay, so next what we wanna do is run our app. So let's go ahead and get our next JS server up and running. Let's go ahead here to our terminal and type npm run dev. Let's try that again. I think I misspelled that, npm run dev. All right, so now that's running. So now let's go to our browser and open up a new tab and see what that looks like. So here I'm gonna come back to our browser and I'm going to type here localhost 3000, localhost co um, colon 3000. Um, this is gonna open up our app on port 3000 within our browser. And as you guys can see, we have a default uh, Next.js view here, All right? And so obviously we don't want this. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go back to Visual, Visual Studio and in this file, in our page.jsx file, I'm just gonna get rid of everything. So I'm just going to do Command A on a Mac or Control A on the wind Windows and get rid of everything here, All right? Now, let me go ahead and save that. And if I go back to our browser, you'll see everything is should be gone. So we're getting an error message. Yeah, the reason why we're getting that error message is because we don't have a component. So uh, before I, I create a component here, I want to share something with you. So in my Visual Studio Code instance, I have an extension ex installed. So if I come down here to the bottom left <clears throat> and I click on the uh, gear icon, and open up extensions, you guys are gonna see that I have a special extension installed. Let me just click on extensions here, and I'm going to type in ES7 React. Yeah, so I have this extension ex installed here, the second one here, called ES7 plus React slash Redux slash React Native. And basically what this extension allows me to do is to use some shorthand commands within my text editor to automatically create um, React components on the fly very quickly versus typing everything out. So it's just a way to save time. So you guys might wanna go ahead and install this extension uh, so that way you can write code a lot faster and follow along with me. So let me give you a demonstration. So right here on line number one, all I have to do is type in R-A-F-C-E, and as you can see, my auto-suggest gives me the command. So if I hit enter, I automatically create a React component. Now, being that this is Next.js, this works perfectly with, within Next.js because Next.js is derived from React, and it's basically a server-side rendering frame, framework for React. So this is gonna work perfectly for us. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this component uh, from page to home page, like that. Um, because this is gonna be our home page where we're gonna put all of our styling and all, all of our components. So if I go back to the view now, as you can see, we're getting home page rendering in the top left. So it's, it's, it's totally ugly, but that's because it's not styled yet. And we're gonna work on the styling shortly. Okay, so let's see, then what's the next thing we wanna do? So let's go back to Visual Studio Code here. 
All right, so I guess the next thing we can work on here is I want to create a .env file, and I basically want to create this file to store our environment variable, and we're essentially going to have just our API key. We can see if we'll include something else later on, but for right now, we definitely need to have an API key for the OpenAI endpoint uh, within our application, and basically we'll be using that uh, .env file to reference this dynamically within our application. So I'm gonna go ahead here and I'm, guys, make sure that this is in your root directory of your project. So I'm gonna create a new file. I'm going to call it .env and hit enter, okay? So within this file, I will have our environment variables. So let's go ahead and get that. All right, so I just went ahead and grabbed that value. So in here, we want to create a new environment variable, and that variable is going to be called next underscore public underscore open AI underscore API underscore key. And I'll set that equal to our new uh, API key. And again, this API key will be deleted after this video is done recording, so uh, don't try to use it. Now, just to quickly explain the next underscore public underscore prefix. So in Next.js, anything that starts with next underscore public underscore will be accessible to the client side and the server side of the application. So this is like a quicker way of, because back in the days at like in Next.js 12 and under, we used to have to create a separate um, sort of uh, component within our next config file to share the config values or the uh, environment variable values between the front end and the back end. So this is uh, a lot sleeker because we don't have to do that step anymore. So we're, do, we're gonna essentially use this API key within our application whenever we make callouts to the open AI service. Okay, so as it stands, we won't really be able to communicate with the open AI API endpoints because we don't have a way to send the callouts from Next.js directly to the endpoints. Uh, we need to install a package via NPM. So to do that, I'm going to come down here and on a Mac, I will hold the control key and press C to stop the service, to stop the server basically. So let's go ahead and clear that out. And I'm going to type here NPM I for install and we want to install OpenAI. Let's hit enter. <clears throat> and that's going to go ahead and install that. And I'm going to show you guys exactly how you know if it's installed. So it's already installed. Now on a Mac, if I uh, hold the command key and press P, it's going to automatically open up a menu where I can quickly navigate to a specific file. So where I want to navigate to, I want to navigate to the package.json file. So going there, if I scroll down, as you can see, OpenAI is installed here. Um, yeah and it's uh, version 4.17.4, .4, so we're good to go here. Now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna set up a couple of folders within some of these parent folders, um, and as well as create a new parent folder for a particular file so we can uh, kinda get our uh, project structured nicely. So the very first thing here in our app folder, I'm going to create another folder, and I'm going to call that components. And this is like standard React or Next.js uh, convention. You generally would have a component, components folder where you would house a lot of your uh, React or Next.js components. So we'll have things in here like a uh, button or you know whatever we decide to make, it'll be in there. Uh, the next thing here is I will, let's see, I'll create another folder called API within the app folder. And this is going to be a folder where we're going to uh, make the callouts to the API, uh, to the OpenAI API directly. Okay, and within this uh, API folder, we're gonna have two more subfolders. So let's go ahead and click on API again to highlight it. And I'm going to create two subfolders. Oh, not sure what happened there. Two subfolders. One's going, going to be called text. And I'm going to click on API again and make sure guys that you're clicking on API make sure it's not highlighted over text. Um, so I'll create another folder here called image. Um, now these are two separate folders or subfolders within the API folder and basically they'll point to two separate endpoints. When we make a call out, for example, the uh, fetch an image uh, from the DALI 3 API endpoint, it'll basically uh, call this route 
These are called route handlers in Next.js 13 and up. So generally we can call a specific endpoint that's featured within this API folder. And uh, through that, we could then make an external call out to a different system or we can store something to a d database, whatever have you. Um, so you'll see exactly how this works shortly. Within both of these folders, I'm going to create an, a new file called route.js. So within image, for example, I'll create a route.js. I'm not sure what happened there. I'm having some issues here. Okay, so let's try that again. New file, route.js. Um, and within the text folder, the same thing. I'll come down here, highlight that, and route.js. Now these files will be where the actual API code will happen, right? We'll actually have two post methods, one in each file, and that post method will make a call out to OpenAI so we can fetch data based on the prompts that we give it. Next, we want to create a utils fi uh, folder within our uh, root directory. So let's go back up here. Let's just make sure we're out of that. I'm just going to collapse that so to make sure I'm in the parent directory. Cool. So now what I'm going to do is create a new file or folder rather, and I'm going to call that utils, short for utilities. And within this utils uh, folder, I'll create a new file. Uh, so that file will be called openai.js. So let's go ahead and create that file. Cool. Now within this file, we're going to um, put some initialization code within it uh, so that we don't have to instantiate a new object. So if that doesn't make sense to you right now, I'll explain uh, shortly. All right, so I know you've been waiting patiently. Let's go ahead and start writing some code. Uh, so on line number one here, um, I guess I'm gonna create a brand new constant variable that will reference the model name. And these model names are necessary for, for us to send in the API callout so that uh, OpenAI knows exactly what kind of uh, GPT model we would like to work with. So let's go ahead and type export const, and we'll call this text underscore model. And we'll set that equal to GPT-4. So this is the value that we're going to be sending the AP, uh, within the API callout. And then GPT will look at this and know that we want to uh, work directly with the text model. The next one we'll define is an image model. So we'll say export const and image underscore model. And we're going to set that equal to doll-e-3. So that's basically the new image model uh, for Dolly, the Dolly image generation API, which also works based on AI technologies. Um, the next thing we'll work on here is we'll um, define our configuration object. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, actually, one thing I wanted to point out here. So I just remembered that the uh, newest versions of the OpenAI package, I've been seeing some errors when I was testing out some code uh, working with the same package, depending on what I was trying to do with the Dolly 3 uh, engine. So what we're going to do is let's just go ahead and uh, let's open up our package.json again. Let's just go ahead and check what version we're using because we may need to install a different version. Uh, so here we have the 4.17.4 and I believe that was causing issues. So what we're going to do is we're just going to change our version to a previous version. We're going to go one below here to version 3.2.1. So let's go ahead and clear out our console below and let's type in here npm i for install open ai at symbol 3.2.1 and hit enter. And that should go ahead and replace the 4.17 with 3.2.1. And as you can see, it's fully installed now. It's in our package JSON. <clears throat> That's great. So let's uh let's go back to what we were doing. So let's go ahead and open up openai.js again. All right, so in this file, what we wanted to do here is we wanted to create our configuration file next. So let's do, let's do that. To do that, we need to type here const, and we're going to uh, destruct a, con um, a configuration object and an open AI API object. But let's go ahead and finish typing this out. Equals, and we're going to just use standard node notation here, required or require and we're going to require the OpenAI package that we installed. Now, uh, within this, we're going to destruct two objects, as I mentioned. The first will be configuration, 
And the second one here will be Open AI API. As you can see, AutoSuggest found it, so we're good to go here. All right. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create the, um, the actual instantiation of this configuration object. So let's type here const configuration. And that's going to be equal to a new configuration. And I'll pause there for a second. Let's just type out the rest of it, opening, closing, parentheses. And within there, we're going to put an opening, closing, uh, curly brace, and we're just going to hit enter for now because we're going to define an object within this configuration instantiation. Let me just back up and tell you for the newbies here exactly what this means. So um, as you know, this is called a variable. We're, when we're defining const, we're basically setting a constant value that will not change within the application. So we are setting a variable here called configuration to equal a new uh, object called configuration. Uh, whenever we say new something, we're basically initializing a new object or a new constructor, uh, constructor rather. Um, and so that's what we're doing right here. And within this constructor, we're going to be passing a couple of arguments that we, uh, or actually just one argument that we need uh, to call the API. So it's nice and simple. Uh, there is a an attribute called API key that it, that it expects. So let's type API key. And in here, what we want to do is reference the API key that we're saving in our .env file. Now, to do that within Next.js is very, very simple. All we need to do is type process.env for the um, environment file or environment variable file, rather. And again, the name of that environment variable was next underscore public underscore open AI. Let's type correctly. Open AI underscore API underscore key. So basically what that's now going to do is it's going to take that API key and pass that into every single API call that we'll make. And I would only need to call this file once. I don't need to call it every single time. So this is basically going to save us a lot of code in the other files that we're working with. So lastly here, what we want to do is return the actual um, object that we'll be using to make the uh, outbound calls. So let's go ahead and type here const open AI. That's going to be equal to a new open AI API instance, this one right here. And in here, we're going to pass the configuration object that we just created above. And finally, we're going to export default open AI. Now what this is all doing here is it's basically creating a brand new open AI object and this is going to be the object we'll be using to make the outbound calls because this package has uh, inner code that runs that automatically calls the endpoints that we specify. And then here we're, we're just going to be returning that object to whatever you know wherever we want to reference it. So this file is completely done. We can go ahead and close out of this and move on. So let's go ahead you know what, I'll go ahead and I'll close all the tabs for now, just to have everything, just to start from scratch here. So uh, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up our layout.jsx. Um, and you can find that within the app folder itself. I just use a shortcut to get there. All right, so this is, again, our the shell of our application. Uh, and within this shell, what we need to do is change a few things here just to uh, spruce things up. So let me just explain what we see here. We see a reference to our globals.css file, which contains our styling. We are also here referencing the Google Fonts library within Next.js, which is awesome. This is like an awesome change they made recently. Vercel um, actually enabled us um, to include Google Fonts much more easily within our application. It used to be that we had to do everything manually, so it's nice and uh, fast now. Uh, we're not going to be working directly with typography in this application. We're just going to go with the default here. I just wanted to explain that a little bit. So the first thing I'm going to do here is we have this metadata object, which sets the SEO title and description. I'm going to change that here. Uh, let's see. What do we want to name that? Let's go ahead and name this uh, AI content generator. Now, essentially, this title is what will show up in the search engines um, if you index. Um, especially toward the top, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> this is what shows up in the search engines and the description as well. So let's just give it a basic description here. What should we type? 
create, let's say create cool text and images, images with AI. Cool. Now, you know, that to you may not mean anything, but I just like to rename that just so, to make sure that I got all of that done up front. Now, the only other thing we're going to change in this folder here, or this file rather, is we're going to create a new main element down here. So uh, actually, let's go ahead and cut out this children. We'll, we'll open up this body tag. And again, because this is the shell of our application, whatever is in this file will be passed on to every single page. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and create a main. Let's say main and open that up. And I'm going to paste in here the children. Now, what this children property means or prop means is that whatever, for example, let's say we have the page.jsx file that we saw before. Let's go ahead and open that up so you know what I'm talking about, page.jsx. As you know, this is our home page. So the way that this works in Next.js is whatever code is written here, whatever JSX code is written after, well, between this um, opening and closing parentheses of the return statement will actually be passed through this layout.jsx file as the child or the children um, within this prop that we're passing in up here. And then this will get outputted within the main block. So however we style this, this will be basically styled within this main tag. So let's go ahead, I'm going to uh, add a couple of classes and these will be Tailwind CSS classes. And as you recall, Tailwind was automatically installed when we created our next project, so there's no configuration uh, needed. Actually, you know what? We will do some minor configuration. I'll come to that in a second. Let's go ahead and just define a couple of classes here. So the first will be the container class, which uh, automatically comes pre-installed with Tailwind. And that's going to basically add some uh, margin and padding on the left and right sides of our page. And then let's go ahead and center that content using MX dash auto so it's going to center it um, horizontally on the page for us to make things look nice and neat finally i'm going to add a padding top and bottom of 10. now if you don't know what that means you can look at tailwind css's documentation it'll basically um, specify how many pixels or rims or m's um, are being used for every single you know um, every single declaration here so for example let me just take this out if I type py dash, let's go back here, py dash, you'll see we have zero, one, two, three, four. This does not mean four pixels, two pixels, and so on. There's actually a predefined number uh, that's associated with every single level. So you'll have to look at their documentation to know exactly what that means. We're just gonna set this to py10 so we can have some padding at the top and the bottom of the, uh, of the main uh, div here. Now, what we're going to do next is, I guess we can go ahead and start working on our page.jsx file, which is our main home page. Then we'll come back later and we'll add the styling. <clears throat> All right. Now, we're going to be doing quite a bit of typing here, so I want you folks to follow along exactly with what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to be creating a few components first. Uh, just to make sure we get things up and running. So let's go ahead and do that. As you recall, you re, uh, we already created the components folder within app. So let's expand our app folder and let's go to components. And the first component I'll create here, let's see. Hmm. What do I, let, let's go ahead and create an output component because that comp component will be used to display uh, the results of any uh, prompt or any uh, request we submit. Um, so we'll go ahead and create a new file and call this output with a capital O dot JSX. And then we'll type in here REFCE as a shortcut and we already have our output uh, component set up. Now we're going to come back to this shortly um, as we build out our output um, because we're going to need to create this component and build it out uh, to show our text and our images and so forth. And that's essentially the way you would set up like these uh, kind of projects, guys. Like you would go uh, one by one incrementally and just create new components as you go along. Um, and it's just a really good way to architect your code and make sure things are nice and simple and reusable over time. So that's exactly how we're going to handle it. We're definitely going to make some mistakes along the way. So just bear with me. That's part of uh, learning. 
the, the learning curve essentially. So yeah, just follow along the best way you can. So the first one here was output. Now we also want to have, uh, as you saw in the original form, we had a set of radio buttons. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna create a radio button group uh, component. And that component will just display the various radio buttons, text and image that we'll have in our application. So I'm gonna create a new file within the components folder. I'm gonna call that radio button group with a capital R radio button group.jsx and here I will create the component as well so that's all good to go all right um, so now I guess what we can do here is we can go back to our page.jsx file so let's go ahead uh, am I typing that correctly page.j here we go all right so within this file what we are going to do is we're going to um, bring in a few components um, as well as uh, create a few um, functions here, a few variables, and state. We're going to be using state here in this application, and I'll explain what that is in a second. The first thing we're going to do is I'm just going to get rid of line number one, this import React from React. We don't really need that anymore. That used to be part of the old convention of referencing the React library. Um, since we're going to be destructing a lot of these properties from React as we need them, uh, we don't really have to declare it this way, so I'm just going to get rid of it. All right, the first thing I'm going to do at the very top of the file is I'm going to, and this is um, new as of Next.js 13 and above, I'm using version 14. I'm going to just come here and I'm going to type a single quote, or a set of single quotes rather, use client, semicolon. And what that's going to do here is this use client Anything with, that's within this component will be rendered on the client side. So um, in Next.js, we have the concept of client side and server side rendering. Client side rendering is basically rendering within your browser using the standard JavaScript on the front end. So the, um, the, the uh, load of loading a page is handled by your browser. Whereas uh, server side rendering, everything is done on the server side, uh, essentially the other side of the fence. Um, and loaded as the page loads uh, initially. So um, in most cases, when we're working with state, which is what we're gonna be using uh, shortly, we need to render that on the client side because things will change after page load, if that makes sense. I would suggest that you guys read up on client side rendering versus server side rendering online. You can also look at Vercel's um, documentation on the nextjs.org uh, website to find out more information about that. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring in this new output, um, this new output uh, component that we created. And again, this is going to be used to render our text and images to the view. The second thing I'm going to do here is, is bring in our radio button group. That's going to be used for the set of radio buttons that you saw in the demonstration at the beginning of the video. Uh, to render the text and images uh, buttons. And lastly, as I promised, I'm going to bring in use state from React. So again, as I mentioned, we had the import React from React. Here we're destructing the use state um, attribute from the, um, the React library. And basically this use state is being used to uh, store the state of our application at a given point of um, you know, execution. And I'll show you a more on how this works shortly. Hopefully it'll make sense. All right, so I guess the first thing we'll do here is we'll start defining our state as we go along. So as you saw in the demonstration at the beginning of the video, we actually have a form because we, um, the form that we have, we have like the radio buttons and then we have like a text area field uh, and then we have uh, a button at the bottom. So what we want to do here is we want to create a new uh, state that would hold um, the values of our form capture. So whatever we capture within the form, we want to be able to store this. Uh, there are some indentation issues. So before I do that, let me just fix some of the indentation. You may or may not be having this, but if you are, if you want to, you can fix this. Um, all right, so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to define a new state here and this is going to be called form data. So to define state within React or Next.js, you type here const opening and closing square brackets and the name of the variable. So it's going to be form data, comma, 
and then the name of the accessor or, or the function that we'll call to store the state. That's going to be called set form data. And we're going to set that equal to use state. And because the form data could be different uh, depending on um, what we are, you know, what we're doing, we're just going to set that to null. So this is going to have a default value of null from the very beginning when the page loads. Next up, we're going to have another state that's going to be in charge of uh, determining if we're loading data or not. And we're going to be using this to, to display a spinner or a loader on the page as the data is being returned. So I'm going to call this loading, comma, set loading. And I'm going to set that equal to use state again. And I'm going to use a Boolean value of false. If you don't know what I mean by Boolean, look at some of my other tutorials on my YouTube channel, the Codiversity channel. We go into Booleans in depth, but essentially what this means here is that uh, by default, we are not loading uh, the data. Okay, so we're setting that as false by default. Good, hopefully that makes sense. Now, the next thing I want to do is, I guess I what we can do is to make things nice and clean, we can create a couple of uh, properties or objects here that represent the radio button options that we can display in our form. So let's go ahead and type out here const radio button. We'll call it radio button options, for example, radio button options. And I'm going to set that equal to an array, all right? an array, so like a list of uh, various objects. And in this list of objects, uh, we're gonna have two objects essentially, one representing each uh, and every, um, each radio button option. So within this, I guess what we wanna do is we wanna have a property or an attribute that represents the ID of the element. So then we'll go ahead and say ID, and we're gonna set the first one equal to text, because that will be the first option. Next up, we're, we want to have an attribute that represents the value of the element. And uh, you'll see what I mean shortly with this. Um, so we'll set the value to the same, which will be just text. And then lastly, we want to have the actual label that will be displayed in the front end. So let's say label, and we'll say call that text with a capital T. So that way it's beautified. All right, so I'll put a comma after that because I'm going to copy this object and make a new line below and paste it in again because we're going to define one more option. So for the second option, we're going to have an ID of image. We're going to have a value of image and then a label of image with a capital I. And this is going to represent our second value. So essentially, we're going to be asking select a content type and then it will be either text or image here. And the reason why we're doing this instead of hard coding it directly below is that we're able to pass this in dynamically um, and we'll have this all in one place so it's nice and easy to adapt um, or to you know modify in the future if we need to. Now normally you would have maybe something like that in the database anyway, but this is just a quick way of doing it. Okay, so I guess the next thing we can do here is let's go ahead and let's start writing out some of our JSX code and then we'll define our handlers afterwards, our handlers that will handle the events. So let me go down here. Um, <clears throat> okay, I guess we can go down here. And here we have this home page output. I'm gonna get rid of that. And now the next part, this is called JSX. Um, JSX is basically a special syntax that we use within React and Next.js to create the actual view within our component or our page. Um, it resembles, it closely resembles HTML. In fact, it uses the same HTML elements. I think the major difference is that JSX is uh, dynamic. So you can also insert JavaScript variables, JavaScript, you know, collections or whatever have you um, to bind data to the view. Uh, so I'll show you what I mean right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new div. And we'll just go ahead and open that up. Now I want to style this div, so I'm gonna say class name, and this is another thing I'll point out in case you haven't seen my other videos. Uh, in Next.js and React, we don't define a style like this. We don't say just class because there can be some sort of uh, collision um, happening between class and a JavaScript class. That's the reason why in these uh, libraries, we uh, say class name. 
to differentiate between a an actual style attribute and a class, which is like a JavaScript class. Um, so the first class here I'm going to put here is space dash y dash five. That's going to give us a little bit of vertical uh, spacing within uh, or between the elements. All right, so now. Uh, the first thing I'll do here is I'll put an H1 heading, and in this H1 heading, I'll uh, put here AI content generator. And that was the heading that we saw in the uh, demo, okay? That's all that is, just text. So the next thing I'll do is I'll create another div and open that up. And in this div, I'll have a class name. Let's see, um, we want to put this in a flex box so we'll just define here flex and what that means is that it's a very it'll become like a very fluid uh, UI so no matter whether you're on mobile or on a desktop when you specify flex it'll try to fit as many elements within a row or a column by default it's a row uh, as many um, elements it'll try to fit within that space as much as possible and if not the browser will do its best to render the content um, either on the next line or wh wherever there is space. It's just a quicker way of styling things and positioning elements on the page. So we'll say flex here, and we'll, we'll be using this flex quite a bit anyway. Uh, so we'll say flex, and we're going to justify, let's see, we're going to say justify between, because essentially in here what we're going to put is the, uh, the two columns. We'll have one side, we'll have that be like uh, the form, and then the other side will be the output. So we definitely wanna put some space between, that's why we're using justify between here. Uh, and then we'll say gap dash 10 uh, to put quite a bit more space there, and then a minimum height of the entire screen length. All right. Now we're also going to be adding some additional styling within our globals, the globals.css file, but we're just going to get the basic styling here done. Next up, we're going to we're going to define a new section. Let's open that up, and in this section, we'll have a class name. So I want this section. This section is going to house our form. So I want that to, let's say, span a third of the page. And again, we're not really styling this for mobile, only for desktop, so I'm not going to worry about responsiveness here. So I want this to span about a third of the page, so I'll do that here. And uh, let's see, within here, we'll create a form. And this form element will have our, all of our inputs and our button as well for the form submit. Now, uh, as part of the next JS or JavaScript uh, sort of a framework, we have an attribute called on submit. So let's type on submit within our form. And basically this on submit um, attribute will, it will listen out for any kind of form submission via our button click, and then we'll automatically call a handler that we create to handle the form submission. It used to be that we have to do this on the server side using just kind of like a standard uh, git or, or, or post method, whatever have you. In this case, we're going to be using JavaScript to do the form submission via sort of an Ajax protocol. So here I'm going to create a new handler called handle submit. And we'll define that shortly. This just, let's just get our uh, styling uh, out the way first and we'll handle the JavaScript later. All right, so within this form, Let's define some inputs. Um, I'm going to use a shorthand via Emmet. I'm going to say form dash input and hit enter. And that's going to automatically create this. You can also type this out, but I'm just going to use my installed Emmet uh, plugin here to quickly create these form inputs. And I'm also going to do it again down here. Uh, that was not correct. Let's do that again. Oops. Let's open that up. Sorry, and then form dash input. That should work. There we go. All right. So the first form input is going to contain our radio button group, um, as you uh, saw in the um, in the demo. All right. So now let's see. Let's first go ahead and create a label. So let's say label, and this label element will have will, will have the question. So select a content type, for example, all right? 
Um, and then under that, we're going to uh, actually display our radio buttons. Now that will be nice and simple because if you recall, we created that uh, we created that component earlier. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and reference in here and say radio button group and close this out like that. Now I'm just going to make some space because what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to pass in a couple of props. <clears throat> and essentially what a prop stands for, it stands for property. And a prop is used to pass values from a parent to a child, for example, or to pass uh, values across your application. Uh, so let me show you what I mean by that. So what we want to do, for example, is we want to pass the text and image options that we defined above as part of the radio button group, we uh, or the radio button options, rather. We want to pass it to this radio button group so that we can reference it and output it to the page. So I'm going to create a new prop called, and, I'm, and I'll create this within the component itself, but for now, let's pass it in. We we'll call this options, and all we're going to do is just pass in the radio button options above. So that way, that becomes accessible to this component. The next thing we'll do is we'll create within the component. We'll just uh, specify it here, an on change handler, and an on change handler will listen for a uh, change that occurs within the state of our application, and then it will, it'll trigger a set of actions. Um, to run. So here what we want to do is we're going to pass in a handle change function that we'll define above shortly. Um, and that what, what basically what that's going to do is every time somebody clicks or selects a, an option as part of the radio button group, it'll automatically store that value as part of our you know state. It'll basically store it to our state and uh, we'll be able to keep track of what value is currently selected. And that's very important for us to do it. You'll see why shortly. Lastly, we'll uh, pass another value called selected option. And again, as I mentioned just, uh, just now, this is going to be the option that we've selected as part of our on change handler. And that's going to be st stored in form data dot, uh, what would that be? Form data dot content type, right? And obviously, we're, go we're going to store that value as part of our form data state. All right. So obviously, to now uh, up to now, there's nothing for us to show in the browser because we, there's quite a bit for us to define. So let's go ahead and uh, continue. So the next thing here is we have a second form input. And this will be the text area field where, we, where the user can input, input a prompt. And a prompt in open AI language is a set of instructions. It's usually like a description of a sort. Uh, that is used by the engine to create the AI content. So we need to create a text area field to capture that input from the user. So let's go ahead and create a new label. And here, let's say, what do you want to create? Right? That will be basically the text. Um, we're going to use an HTML4 attribute. In, in this case, because we want to, it to, um, when we use this, and I'll just label this as prompt, when we use this, this will basically directly link this label to the text area input so that if we click on the label, for example, it'll automatically put focus on the text area, uh, which is pretty neat. All right, so now next up, we'll put here a text area um, uh, tag here. And uh, there will be a few attributes that we'll define here. Okay, so I'll just make a new line here. The first one will be ID, and we're going to call that prompt. Okay, um, and, and this is also important too, um, because this is how we're going to reference it later. Specifically, this name attribute is very important. We'll also name that prompt because we're going to use that to pull the values as part of the, the form submission. Um, we're going to be using this as a reference point. All right. Um, let's go ahead and define a placeholder. So the placeholder that I'll add here will be enter a brief description. I think that's good, right? Dot, dot, dot. And that's a good, just going to be part of our, um, you know, if there's no input entered, it's going to, it's going to display this uh, placeholder text. 
and then we'll define a value here. Now the value by default, we want that to be set to form data dot prompt. Okay, and we'll, we'll have to go back up and define that um, later on. Okay, um, so what that means is, you know, form data dot prompt will be by default null. So basically nothing will be um, the value. The value will be null, it'll be nothing from the very beginning. Um, but then as we progress through the application, start capturing data from the user, we're going to update this prompt attribute within the form data object itself, which is part of our state. Okay. So now the next thing here is we'll define an on change um, handler here. And this event will be triggered um, and then we'll call the handle change method, which is the same method or uh, function that we defined above. And lastly, we want to set this as required. In fact, that's something I forgot to do above. So basically, let me go back up here. Um, do, 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 do. Actually, we'll define required within the radio button group itself. And the reason why we want to define required is we don't want the form to be submitted unless the user has inputted something. Otherwise, we'll just be wasting API calls. All right, I think that's it here. So I'll go ahead and let me just bring this up again to the end of that, like that, just to keep things nice and clean. So I think we're good there. The last thing we want to do here is we want to add a button. And that's going to be the actual um, component that triggers the form submission process. We're going to call this a button type of submit. We must say submit in order for this to work. And then class name, let's see, we're just going to use BTN because we're going to uh, create a class um, uh, rule, a CSS rule called BTN in our globals.css that will style this button accordingly. Uh, so now we're going to, do, 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 do. what I want to do is that when the button, uh, when, the, when, the, um, when the view is being loaded or the data is being loaded, I want it to be disabled. I want this button to be disabled when that happens. You guys probably see this very often when working with forms on other websites. So let's go ahead and do that. There is a disabled attribute on the button element. And what we can do here is use our trusty loading, um, our trusty loading state that we defined above. So basically when the site is loading, when this is equal to true, this button will be disabled, meaning that, that the user cannot continue to click and resubmit the request. And this is good practice to avoid users from spamming the heck out of, um, out of a button. Lastly, I'm going to uh, call this button generate. This is going to be the button text itself. All right, so let's see, I think, I think we're good there. I'm trying to think here. Yeah, there is one more section we need to define. So I think we're good with this section. Let's go ahead and define the next one. So this first section refers to the form. We need another section. So let's go below section here and add a new one. And in this section, we'll have a class name of uh, width of two thirds of the page. So above we have one thirds and we just want to cover the other two thirds. Now, you may be thinking, well, this is going to expand the entire page and there will be no space between. But if you guys recall above here, we just uh, we uh, specified a justified between. So that's going to automatically pad, um, you know, and add space in between the left and the right column. All right. Or the left and the right content to be more specific. So now within this section, I'm going to reference our output. Okay, I want that to be self-closing like that. And this is, the, again, the content or the results that we get back from the API. So let's go ahead and pass in a content type. I think, yeah, we'll, we'll pass in a content type uh, prop. And this prop will be coming from the form data dot content type. And then what we'll do is we'll pass in a results, which will be the actual content, and that will be results. And I think we forgot to create the results state above, so we'll come back to that shortly. 
we, I just want to create one called results. And then lastly, we'll pass in a loading like that. So that way we can display our loader uh, within that content window. All right. So let's see. I think, yeah, the last thing I want to do here, as I said before, is I want to create the results. Right. I think, I think that's, let me think here. What do I want to do here? I just want to see. Okay, what, there's actually one more thing we want to do. So let's go ahead and in the form data, let's go ahead and create some default values here. So let's, we'll come back up to the form data uh, state and we'll just open up a curly brace left and right and just hit enter, space that out a bit. And in here, we're just going to set some default values. So in here, I'm going to set content type to an empty string. So no text, no value. It's not a null, it's just an empty string. And then next, we'll set the prompt to an empty string. Now, why am I doing that, you may be asking. Well, I thought about null initially, but it may be better if we just go ahead and define this object um, and preset these uh, attributes. So that way it's nice and clean and we know what we're working with. In the case of TypeScript, a lot of this stuff would be adhered to anyway, like you would um, maybe define a type or an interface that you can use. But since we're not using TypeScript, uh, I think we just have to do a little bit more discipline here and make things a lot cleaner and a lot more uh, you know, simplified here. So we'll go ahead and just define that. And then the other thing I wanted to do was create that results state. So down here, I'm going to say const results set results and that's going to be equal to you state and here I'll, I'll set this as null because again the reason why i'm setting this as null is we're not sure if, if this is going to be um an object or uh just simple text so we may want to store either or so let's just set that to null we'll, we won't you know predefine and um a type at all here so i think we might be done with this. Let me just think about this. Um, I think this might be done. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else we want. So let's just kind of scroll down here to make sure we're passing this out. Yeah, cool. All right, so the next thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll start working with some of our styles. Um, so let's go ahead and let's open up our globals.css file. We will have a few styles to define here, so just kind of just follow along the best way you can. All right, so as you see above, just to kind of briefly explain, we have these three directives that's being referenced above. This is part of our Tailwind CSS library that was installed as part of our uh, Next.js project setup. So we're going to be using Tailwind throughout this entire application, so there's a few things we want to uh, establish here. The first thing we want to do is we're going to create a new layer. And we're going to use this base directive that we see above. And basically within this layer, we would reference any, D, um, any sort of HTML tag elements here, not necessarily uh, ID or class selectors, uh, but specifically the elements. So for example, I would type in here HTML embody to affect the HTML embody tag elements. And on this, for example, I want to apply. So I'll say at apply here. And let's see what I want to apply. I wanted I want to do kind of default to a no margin um, and no padding all around. And I want to have a back a black background. So I would say BG dash black. And this is a tailwind class. These are all tailwind utility classes. Okay. Um yeah, let's go ahead and finish this out, um, and then we'll be able to render this once we finish out our other components. All right, so there's more to define here. The next thing we'll do, I'm going to establish uh, white text for the entire application as a default. So I'm just going to use an asterisk, and I'm going to, once again, apply text-white here. So that's going to make all of our text within our application white by default. Okay. I could have also used the colon root 
Um, but since I'm using this layer, I would rather just kind of keep things cohesive and uh, do it this way. Next up, I want to style our, our fields, our input fields. So the first one here will be input, opening and closing uh, square brackets, type is equal to radio because we're going to um, style our radio buttons here, comma, and then text area. So this is going to, oops, let's text area like that. This is going to affect our input field. So we're going to apply. And here, let's do with full and then a background of BG dash gray dash 900. That's going to give us a very dark gray background. The, and just to kind of really quickly ex explain this. So when we're working with things such as um, colors, you'll have different intensifiers here. As you can see here in my IntelliSense is telling me that I can select BG dash gray dash 50, 100, 200, 400, and so on. Basically, the higher the number, the darker the color or the darker the hue. The lower the number, the lighter or um, the hue or the color. So in this case, I want a very dark gray, so I'm using 900 for this. Um, next up, I want to remove any outlines uh, that can uh, be displayed around the elements. So I'll say outline none. Um, and then on focus, so we'll type focus colon. So uh, when you do this, you can pretty much assign this to any property or almost any property ra rather. So in this case, when I hover over um, the element, I do not want to display a border. So I'm going to say border dash none. And the reason why I'm doing this is because in some browsers, sometimes additional styling is added and we just want to add this here to make sure that that doesn't happen. Next up, I'm going to give a padding all around of two. That's going to give a padding top, bottom, left, and right of level two, which can be, I think it's about, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I think about one rim. I'm not sure. I would have to double check. But, you know, I normally play with these levels until I find something that's good. I really don't care about the pixels and rims um, as long as it's responsive and it looks good. Next up, I want to establish my own border here. So I'll say border and then border dash gray dash 500. Okay. Now, the difference between that and the focus one above, um, prior is that this will be displayed whether I'm focusing on the element or not. So if you're in case you're wondering why I'm, why did I take away the border and then I'm bringing it back, that's because the first focus colon border none just references what happens when I hover, only when I hover. In this case, I want a border to be displayed at all times. That's why I'm doing this. Next, I will do rounded SM to uh, add a little bit of border radius to make things look a little bit rounded. I think that's all the styling I want in this case. Okay, cool. So as you can see, that's quite a bit, but uh, Tailwind makes things a lot easier because if you were to write this as normal CSS, this would take so many lines to code, it's ridiculous. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is I'll create another rule here. Um, and this rule will give the text area a certain height. All right, so let's say text area. And in here, I'm going to apply a height of six rims. So six REM. Now, I believe that one rim is 16 pixels. So you pretty much multiply 16 times six and you'll figure out, um, I think it's what, 96? How many pixels that would be? Okay. All right. So uh, yeah, I want to give roughly a hundred pixels of um, height to the text area, so that way it's nice and lengthy. Now I could have done that with line, also the number of lines, but I, I just want to do it here to keep things in one place. Next, I will style the H1 that we use on the home page. So let's apply a style. Let's see. Uh, in the template that we saw, um, we had bolded text. So what I'll do here is I'll make it semi-bold. So I'll say text semi-bold, so not fully bold. My auto sense is not working. Let's go back, text semi-bold, huh, that's weird. All right, text semi-bold, that should still work though. 
So we want to semi bold the text and then I'll add some padding on the top and bottom of level two and then text center. We want to center it in the middle of the page. Cool. I'll just go ahead and save that with command S or control S on a window or Windows machine. All right. So the next thing will be our H3 because we're going to have a couple of H3s um, that we'll be using. And I'll apply to that text of 2XL. This is just going to make our text um, um, extra large uh, on, a, on a, you know, doubly extra large. In fact, you know, one thing I forgot here is we want this to be large too, this H1. So I'll make this, it'll come back up to H1. I'll make this text 4XL to make it very large. And down here, I'll make this text 2XL. And we may or may not use this element. I'm just going to do it here just in case I want to use it. All right, so we'll say font dash bold and then top and bottom padding of level two. All right, that's looking good so far. Um, there is one additional element. Um, actually, there's an additional styling I want to put on the radio buttons. So let's do here down here input again of type radio. All right. Now, what I want to do here is actually, let me think about this. I'm going to create two rules here. One will be to style the radio buttons themselves, and then the other one would be to style them when they're checked. So what? Ha how do they look when they're actually selected? So this first one will be for unselected or all radio buttons. Um, do, 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 do. What's going on? Okay, so we'll apply here. We'll go ahead and apply appearance none. What that's going to do is get rid of the default radio button styling that the browser normally gives. We're, we're going to give it a width of one rem, so one rem. And in, guys, in case you didn't uh, recognize this or realize, um, we can actually specify a number of pixels or a number of rims by using the square brackets after W dash. And that applies to just about any sort of um, tailwind styling that uses rims or pixels. Uh, so if you don't feel like using levels, you can do it this way. I would encourage you to use the levels, uh, you know, the dash 5, dash 10, and so on, instead of doing this. The reason why I'm doing this is just to ensure that is exactly one rim or 16 pixels in width. Uh, the next thing here will be rounded full because we want this to be a full circle, completely circular. Uh, the next thing is we'll say outline none as we did above. I think that's what we want here. We just want to kind of get rid of that default ugly styling that comes as part of the browser uh, styling um, style sheets. All right. Now, the other thing I want to do is I'm, I'm just going to come back up here and I'm going to copy this entire selector and come back down here and paste it. And then I'm going to put a colon and checked because this is going to be our styling for checked radio buttons. So here I'm going to apply a background of blue 400. So basically, when we select the radio button, the background will change to blue. That's all that means. All right. All right, so now the next layer I want to create will uh, be related to components because we're going, we're going to be creating a couple of custom CSS classes. So let's here type at layer components and open up our curly braces here. So as you know, we've already used a form input class, or what we've written so far on a JSX. So let's go ahead and style that. So form input here. And as you know, the difference here, as you can see, uh, between the base directive and the components directive is that here I'm referencing an actual class name, whereas above I'm just referencing the, uh, the element name. All right, so just keep that in mind. Anything that's sort of like a custom class that you create, you put it in this components uh, block here. All right. I'd say for our form input div, let's go ahead and apply 
padding on the top and bottom of four, and then some space of Y2. So that's basically going to give us a little bit of space or padding between each element within this uh, form input. So in the case of our radio button group, for example, we'll have some padding between the question and the set of radio buttons. All right. Um, uh, I believe we also use a button or a BTN class. So let's go ahead and create our button styling. And this is going to be on our generate button, obviously, our submit button. Um, so let's go ahead and apply. And what I want to apply is BG dash blue dash seven, sorry, 700. I want to make it Sodar. Oops, 700. Here we go. Little, a little on the darker side. Um, but however, when I hover on this, not when I focus, and I'm, uh, let me correct something I said earlier. So when I said focus, I meant if it's selected, but a hover is when you hover your mouse over an element. So uh, when I hover my mouse over the button, I want a darker blue color. So I'm gonna say BG-Blue-800. So it's gonna give it a slight tint when I hover over the mouse button, just to make things look a lot visually appealing, a lot more appealing. So then we're gonna have a width of full, and that's gonna span the entire uh, content, um, the entire button, or the button rather, within the entire container that is that is within. So um, without this, obviously the button will just sort of be aligned to the left and it wouldn't span the entire width. So we need to specify that to give it that uh, effect. And then P-2 for some padding all around. And then what we want to do is we're going to say rounded full because that's going to give the button a pill look. It's going to look like a, a tablet or a pill. And you've seen this commonly in a lot of modernized applications. Uh, we're going to give it font bold, which is going to um, boldify or bolden, rather, uh, the text within the uh, button itself. And let's see, what else do I want to do? I want to give it the uppercase that we saw in the, the demo as well. Cool. All right. That's quite a, quite a bit of style. Uh, there. So I think for button, that's it. That's what we want for button. Ah, you know, we, what we also want, now that I think of it, is we want to uh, style the disabled state of the button. Remember, we define disabled is equal to loading. So let's go ahead and do that. So dot button colon disabled. So when the button is disabled, and by the way, if you're in case you're wondering, if you're not very knowledgeable in CSS, Basically, this colon disabled is a pseudo class within CSS, and basically it uh, represents the state of an element that it's assigned to. So in this case, we're looking for the disabled state uh, of this button. Um, and so this style will be rendered when the button becomes disabled. So we're going to say add apply BG dash gray, and we're going to give that somewhat of a medium dark of 700 so that the user knows, okay, this is disabled, I can't do anything else with this button until it's no longer loading. Um, cool. Let's go ahead and style the output as well. So we, we're gonna have a class eventually called output within our output component, and we can use that. Uh, we we'll say apply, and uh, we'll give it a flex grid of justify, center so that all the content will be centrally um, uh, positioned items dash center this is basically going to be our um, you know vertical and horizontal centering when we specify this and then h dash screen which will give us um, the, the, the the height of this element of this output will stretch the entire length of the screen or the height of the screen and then bg dash gray dash 900 just to give us a little bit of a highlight uh, even though it's a very dark color is actually still lighter than black and then lastly we'll say shadow dash sm close that out and that shadow will be a, like a box shadow behind the element just to give it a little bit more pop okay so um we also mentioned that we'll have a loader so i'm going to say dot loader and we still have to create a our loading.jsx file which will house our loader. We, pro we probably can do that next. Um, 
But here, let's style it. Um, we'll say at apply and justify. Uh, justify. Ooh, I cannot spell today. Justify dash center. Um, and screen. We, we want that to span the entire height of the screen. So basically what this is, this will be the background to our spinner, right? So when we're loading content, this background will be a foreground. It will show over our main content and it, it'll give a sort of a darkened effect uh, to the view. So that's what we're doing here. Um, Cool. What else do I want to do here? Hmm. So I have our loader. I guess outside of this, um, you know what? Outside of this, I want to create, I'm going to create a CSS class outside of this because we'll be dealing with some pretty, um, some pretty complex styles here. So what I'm going to do, and you'll see what I mean in a second, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go outside the scope of this, um, this uh, layer. So let me just bring this up here. And you see this last curly brace here? I'm just going to go down here outside of that because now I'm going to use basic CSS or uh, default CSS to style the spinner because uh, in Tailwind, we, we could do it in Tailwind also. But I found that um, for the spinner specifically, because I need the animation uh, to occur, we need to define our spinner class as well as our keyframes um, directive below this to make things work properly. All right, and you'll see what I mean in a second. We may have to make a couple adjustments after that. So first, I'm going to have a spinner class, and again, guys, this is outside of our layer, so make sure you're outside of our layer. Okay, so. We'll have a, a, and this is going to be normal CSS now. So we'll have a border attribute. And in here, we're going to say four pixels in thickness, solid. And let's see, let's give it an RGBA value. Let's close that out. Um, of zero, 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 and zero dot one. All right. That A represents the opacity, by the way. So that's what we're doing here. Next up, we're going to, we're going to say border dash left dash color. This is to make the actual spinner. And let's set that to light blue. Just to give it some more pop there. All right, now we'll say border radius. Now, what I'm thinking about doing here is I'm going to set border radius to 50%, and that's to make it fully rounded. So it's kind of like doing the same as rounded full as, as we did above in Tailwind. All right, so that's what I'm doing here. We'll set a width of 40 pixels. All right. Um, we'll set a height also 40 pixels to make things nice and squared around. Not necessarily a square, but to, to make things uh, proportionate around uh, all sides. Um, do, 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 do. What else do we want? Okay, so now we, we get to the nitty gritty here with the animation. So we have an attribute or um, style called animation in CSS, and we can say spin. We want to spin this spinner, obviously. Uh, let me try that out again. I'm not sure what happened. Animation, spin. Okay, that's better. Um, and we want to trend, use the transition of one second. So basically, it's spinning every second to, to make it look like it's spinning continuously. And then we'll say linear. That's just part of the um, sort of grading here that we can use as part of this attribute. And then infinite. So it will spin forever. This animation will rotate forever. Okay, so then we'll set a color here. And I, I'm thinking about using white just to kind of make it stand out a bit and make it easy to see. And lastly, lastly we'll set a margin. Uh, okay, so for the margin, we'll use a margin top and bottom of zero. And we'll use a one rim or 16 pixel um, left and right margin. 
All right, I think that would do that. I think this would uh, this would work here. You know what? Let me go ahead and before we uh, continue, because this was some of the styling I had already pre-written. What I'm going to do is let's go ahead and um, we'll come back to this because we'll have to come back and do our keyframes to make the animation work. Let's go ahead for now and finish some of our components that we need to work with. So I'm going to close um, with just about all of these and we can always reopen them as we need them. Let's close all of these tabs here. All right. And in our components folder, I guess for us, let's work on, um, you know what we'll do first is uh, I mentioned earlier, we'll need to create a spinner or a loader. So we need to create a loading.jsx file. So I'm going to click on the app parent folder here of app, and I'm going to create a new page essentially. It's going to be called loading.jsx. So again, uh, the reason why this is more like a page is because I'm not putting this within the components folder. So then Next.js will read this almost like a page. So let's say refce, and we'll call this loading. Okay. So now this um, this component, Next.js 13 and above, they have implemented a brand new sort of mechanism where we can create a loading.jsx file. It has to be named that, loading.jsx. And automatically, if you're rendering on the server side, um, it will automatically um, render the spinner between requests, between page requests. However, in this uh, tutorial, we're, we're going to be using client-side rendering because we're working directly with state. So we're going to be using this spinner um, as a means of working with the state. It will have like a loading state, and then we'll be using, uh, we'll be loading this spinner depending on what the value of that state is, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's go ahead and create our loader. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's get rid of this code here in our return statement. And instead, I'm just going to put a div with a class name of loader. And that was the same class that we just styled, this loader class, OK? All right, so in this loader class, we'll have another div. And let's see, what do I want to do here? Hmm. I think what, what we'll do is we'll just give it a class name of spinner. This won't really have any content between the, the tags here because by default, um, the spinner style that we define in our globals.css file will be um, outputted or rendered here. And so we don't necessarily need text here, but we will have text after this. So I'm going to add a span tag after that. And in this span tag, I'm going to say, please wait, dot, 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 okay? Three dots, one, two, three, there we go. Um, and let's see, I'm going to give that a class name and we'll do text, sorry, we'll do font bold, font bold. I think the size will be fine. Cool. So I think that should be it for that class. That's essentially all we want to do. And, uh, what we'll do is we'll be using this loading, uh, referenced, uh, within our page, our page.jsx file, and you know, we'll check if loading, then display this component. It's just as simple. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Next up, what we want to do is let's let's go ahead and work on our radio button group because what we want to do is we, we eventually want to test this out to see how this looks. Um, in our radio button group, we already set up our component, but we need to make a few changes here. So let me think of what. What should we do, guys? Um, let's start off by bringing in our use state attribute. So I'm just going to, since this is part of React, I'm just going to come here, get rid of this, and say use state. All right. Cool. All right. Oops, I got rid of a, here we go. Perfect. All right, so we brought in the use state because what we're going to do is we're going to create a few states here that we possibly could use. In fact, you know what? I may not need to use state here because what we'll do instead is we'll pass in the props as we had done earlier. We had specified the props that will get passed into this. So I'm going to get rid of that view state 
we can all uh, use state rather we can always bring it back if we need it instead what i'm going to do is i'm going to pass in the props and if you don't know where this is com coming from let me just go back to page.jsx and if i look for a radio button there it is. So as you see here, we're passing in op um, options on change and selected option. And these are the props or properties, uh, these values we're passing into this component. So when we go into this component, we can just pretty much reference these. Either we can do one of two things. We can either just reference this as props like this, or we can actually destruct and then say like options, selected options and whatever. I'm not going to do that right here. I'm just going to pass this in as props like this, uh, and then I'll use it directly below. You can do it either way. Um, either way is fine. All right, so what do I want to do here? Um, we don't want to define any state. I guess what we can do is let's get rid of this div, and we'll just say div like that and open that up. Let's define a class name. And I want this to be in a flex box. So say flex and then center the items and then put a gap of dash 10, level 10, 10, yeah, like that, okay? All right, so that's gonna put that in a flexible grid or a flexible box rather. All right, and then the next thing we'll do here is we want to loop over with the options that we're, pa we're passing in sort of like a, a list of options to this uh, component. And the list of the options will, will be that object that we defined before. If you guys recall, we had the object. Let me just go back to it so you can see what I mean. Page.jsx, come on. It's quicker this way, so just go up here. See, you see this, this um, array we defined here? We have these objects, this text and image um, object that's being stored within this array. So what we want to do is we don't want to directly hard code each within the component. Rather, what we want to do is loop over this array and output every object's attribute to the page or whatever, wherever we need to use it. So let's go back to our radio button group component. And ooh, what happened here? Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, let's just fix this closing thing. Guys, as I mentioned before, making mistakes is a normal part of the business. So, you know, if you guys caught that, you know, bravo to you. Um, yeah, so what we want to do here is we want to come here and, and let's uh, go ahead and loop through some of this. So let's loop through the list of options we're receiving from the parent. So props.options, because the, the, the options will, again, be part of that, um, as you can see, going back here again to um, page.jsx. The radio button group here, radio button. Yeah, you see here we're passing in options right here. So it has to be props that options, and eventually we'll say props that on change and props that selected option uh, where, wherever we need it within that component. So let me show you how that works. And again, uh, this tutorial is more so focused on you know absolute beginners or people who are fairly intermediate in the language or in the framework. So. You know, I may be taking quite a while to explain things, but it's for the benefit of people who are brand new to this um, for them to learn. So we'll say props.options. Now, I'll, I'll just write out the entire thing here, this uh, entire line, and I'll explain something. So we'll say props.options.map, parentheses. Let's stop there. Um, one thing we need to do here is we need to include a question mark after options. And the reason why we're doing that is because when a page first loads, and again, we're rendering this uh, through use client, when a page first loads, um, it could be that options are not populated, especially if we're pulling it from a database. So what we need to do is just put a question mark here to, to specify that this is a nullable type and it may not exist at the time of page load, so that way we won't see any error messages. So this dot map function is a JavaScript function that would actually cycle through or loop through a, an array or any other type of collection uh, in JavaScript. So uh, we're gonna use that to output uh, specific values to, uh, to the view. All right, so within the map, first we need to define um, special parameters or arguments rather so the first will be the option the current option of that iteration 
And then the next will be an index, which will represent the counter variable. And you'll see why I'll need that shortly as well. So we'll make this an arrow function. And I'm thinking a second on the fly here. Let's go ahead and just open that up with the curly braces. So make sure you put the curly braces opening and closing after the arrow, which is the equal and the uh, greater than sign, and open that up. Now, the reason why I'm using index is because I need to specify a key. Whenever you're working with a map or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, loop uh, in JavaScript, specific, specifically within JSX, you need to specify a key in order for this to, to avoid erroring out. Nothing will break if you forget the key, but this is just a good way for the framework to know exactly how things should be indexed. So, for example, here, let me just... Why is this not working? I mean, my autocomplete's not working, so let's just do that. I might be having an error. So just do an opening and closing div. And here up top, we're gonna say key is equal to index. So that's gonna give a unique key to every single um, div that's being outputted here. And this is just, an, again, a way for, for the uh, framework and the browser to know exactly which uh, element we're targeting in a certain instance. So next up, we'll have a class. Let's give this a class of flex as well, because we want the, the elements within this to be flexible. And we're going to see items dash center and then space dash x dash three to give it some horizontal spacing uh, between uh, the elements themselves. All right, so the next thing here we're going to actually put our input. So let's say input. Sorry, this should be a closed self-closing tag. So for our input field, we're going to say type is equal to radio. This is going to be our radio button. Okay. Um, and then we'll give it an ID. So the ID will be option.id. Now this option again is coming from up here when we're seeing, you know, up here we were saying option comma index. This option will be the current iterate uh, within the current iteration, this will be an option. So this will be, for example, uh, in the first iteration, it would be the text uh, object that's in the radio button options in the parent uh, component. So that's the reason why we have to say here option.id to access the ID attribute from that object. Hopefully that made sense. So we'll say here name, and that's going to be option.id as well. Well, actually, no, did we define a type? Uh, do, 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 do. No, no, you know, actually, you know what we want to do here? For name, we're going to say name is equal to content type as a string. Uh, and the reason why is this is a radio button group. So we want the behavior of the, we want the browser to behave as such. When I click on an option, I want to deselect any other selected option. If I don't specify the same name for both radio buttons, then basically the user will be able to select both. And we don't want that. We want them to just select one or the other. So that's why we have to hard code a name here. So we're going to also be using this content type uh, name value within our form submission so we can reference this input field and then grab the values associated. So speaking of value, the next thing we'll define here is value. And that will be option.value here. And this value is coming from that object that we defined uh, in our page.jsx file, once again. Um, and then we'll say checked and for checked hmm, how do we want to do this what we want to do for checked is we want to reference the selected option that we're passing in and we want to check if that's equal to the current value so we're going to say props that selected option is equal to option dot value so basically um, if a, if the component re-renders, if the currently selected option is equal to one of these values, then it will auto-select the value by default, meaning that, you know, we've already captured the value, 
it's equal, so just automatically fill in the bubble for one of the radial buttons. That's all that means. Uh, and we definitely want that because we want to be able to keep track of the state of selection for this, uh, for this input. Lastly, we have a couple more. So we say on change. And for the on change event, we're going to say props.onChange. And that's going to be the uh, event handler that we'll pass in from the parent. And then we'll say required as we did for the text area field. So if the user doesn't select anything, the form submission won't work. It'll, it'll actually give a browser error, a client side error saying you need to make a selection. You need to choose one or, or, uh, or other, the other. So one of the radio buttons you'll need to select in order to, to proceed. We're not going to create any type of like custom um, validation or anything like that because I want to keep things nice and simple for this crash course. So that's the reason why we're you know going to keep things uh, pretty rudimentary, if you will. All right. So let's see here. We have. OK, so we've done that. Now, what we need to have here is we need to actually have the labels after them. Right. Because so far we only have the buttons. So let's create a label. And as part of the label, uh, you know what, let me make, let me open that up and we're going to output with curly braces here, option.label, because remember we specified that in the parent class as well. And let's give this label a class and the class, uh, let's give it a class of cursor dash pointer. All right, so that what that's going to do is when we hover over the label, it's going to uh, display the cursor as a pointer, like that, uh, like a finger pointing at it. If we don't do that, then the cursor will just stay as an arrow. Uh, so yeah, we we want to just give it a little bit better UX. The thing I forgot to add here is an HTML4 because we want to add that so that uh, when a user clicks on a label, it'll automatically select. Um, the bubble. So we're going to just say label four and then option dot ID. So again, if we, when we click on the word text or image, it'll automatically select the appropriate uh, bubble or button rather. All right. Um, let me see. I think we're good with this here. Let me just make sure here. Radio button group. I think we're good with this. Let's go ahead and try to, to render um, to render what we have so far because we don't know what we have. Let me just see. Uh, if I were to refresh this, refresh. Okay, I don't think my server is running, is it? Okay. Did I X out of it? Yes, I did. All right, let's clear our window here. Let's do npm run dev in our console below. Hopefully that's going to render. I do anticipate some error messages happening, so we'll, we'll walk through them one by one. Okay, so now if I refresh, it may take a while, guys. Okay, so we have some error messages here. So the first one here is Okay, guys, so kind of looking at the um, the error message, it looks like it's complaining about the text semi-bold. I think I recall that the IntelliSense didn't pick that up. So as you can see here, if you guys go back to the H1 declaration within your global CSS, basically the H1 uh, uh, styling rule within the layer, the base layer, you want to change this text semi-bold to font semi-bold. I believe that would fix the issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of text semi-bold here. I'm just going to try font semi-bold and see. Yeah, there we go. It's actually font semi-bold. So that should fix that issue. Let's go back and see if we get any more errors. Okay, so we have another one here. Um, and this one is related to form, and that's because we haven't defined our handlers yet. So now we'll have to go to back to our page.jsx file and create our handlers. So let's go back and do that. And you know, I anticipated these errors happening because there's quite a bit of moving parts to this. So I'm gonna go back, command P and open up page.jsx. And let's just kind of look at what we need to do here. So we have this handle submit function on our form, okay? 
And as you recall, this is going to get triggered when the form is submitted. So what we need to do now is we need to create our handlers. And event handlers are basically functions that get uh, called when a specific event happens within JavaScript. Um, this phenomenon is experienced in many different programming languages, so it's just not a JavaScript-specific thing. It's just that the terminology that we use to describe it may differ. All right, so let's go ahead and create our event handlers. We're going to create the one for the handle submit that we see here, but we're also going to create one for the handle for handling the changes um, to the form um, inputs. So let's go back up here and um, where do we want to put this thing? Um, I would say let's put it right below our uh, options here, our radio button options. Yeah, I think that's a good place. Or actually, you know what? We'll put it right below our state. That sounds pretty good here. State radio button. Yeah, we'll put it down here, right below radio button options. It's probably the best practical place for it. All right, so the first one I'll define here is const handle change. And I'm going to set that equal to, this is an arrow function in JavaScript. We're going to be passing in an event object as an argument. Um, that's, that happens by default whenever an event occurs. And we're just going to open up our curly braces like that. So now in here, what we want to do is um, <clears throat> we want to, uh, whenever a change occurs, for example, when a user inputs something in the text area field, whenever they select the radio button, we want that to be automatically updated within our form data state. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll say set form data because again, this is the function that is ref, uh, referenced by the um, uh, reference rather in the state above. And I'll show you guys right now. So if we go back up here, we see that we have this set form data, right? This set form data function right here. And this function, um, you can use this function to update your state within the application. Okay. So let's go back down here. So what we want to do is we want to set the form data um, uh, whenever a change occurs to a form input. And to do that, we need to first get the existing form data. So we're going to do dot, dot, dot form data. And what that dot, dot, dot operator does is it spreads the current values across the entire form data array. Okay, because again, this is an array of objects, right? Um, or actually rather an object, an um, a JavaScript object, so we're going to spread those values across the existing uh, values. And then next here we're going to say uh, what we need to do is um, as part of the event handler, uh, when we pass in this E object as an argument, we would get access to the name that's on the element. If you guys recall on the HTML element, we specified, I believe it was prompt for the text area field and for the um, uh, for for the options for the uh, radio button options, it was the content type name. So what we need to do is we can reference that here using the variable of uh, or the uh, property e .target name. So when the form is submitted, is going to be passing in you know content type as a string as the e .target name, and then for the text area, is going to pass in the name of uh, prompt. And we want to basically use that name to get that stored as the uh, the key of this uh, object. All right. So if, I'm not sure if that made sense, but you'll see what I mean in a second. So e dot target dot value will be the value that's being submitted as part of the form. Um, so basically, here's an example of what I mean. Let me just add some comments here on the side. When we're passing in this e, um, the content type field. Um, will be so the name will be content type like this so it'll be like content type and then the value and this is just practice this is basically json so it there will be like uh, curly braces like this the value of that content type will be for example text so it looks something like this so this is what's happening on this line right here and i can just leave these comments here uh, for you guys to know that so that's exactly what's happening right here. And then this likewise also for the um, for the prompt field, it would be something like prompt. Um, and then it would be like 
this is my text, whatever the user inputs. And that's what's happening right here. And that's, that's this is better to do than actually doing this like hard coding as yourself. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this handler. Um, the other thing, now that I'm thinking of it, uh, that we might want to do also is we have a results state above as well. If I scroll back up here, we have a results. Now this would be the uh, results that's being returned from the API. So whether it be a string of text or if it be like um, an image URL, for example, it would be a result. What we may want to do is whenever a change occurs, we may want to reset this to null because if we don't do that, if we make a change, it could be that the prior content will still remain in the output window. So I'm just going to say set results and then pass a null here. And that's going to be going to basically reset every single time there's a change is going to reset the results to null. All right. So I think that handler is good to go. Uh, next up, what we want to do is finally handle the form submission. So I'm just going to come down here and I'm going to say const handle submit is equal to e and then pass in that um, that event object. Now for form submissions, the default behavior is that when you submit a form, uh, it automatically redirects based on the uh, action that you give the form. Because we're using Ajax and JavaScript to submit this form, we have to prevent the default action from running. So there is a function that's part of the event object called prevent default. So we're going to say e dot prevent default. And what that's going to do is going to stop the default form submission action. Um, and it's going to allow us to kind of overwrite that behavior within our application. All right. So the next thing we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to set results to null so that when a form is resubmitted again, we're basically going to clear out the prior results. That's all we're doing here. Uh, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to now work with our loading state. So we're going to set loading to true. And that's basically going to display our loader. And down here, I'm just going to do set loading to false before I forget it as well. This will automatically um, hide the loader once we get our data returned. So now we're going to write some more code in between this, right? So. All right, so we got our preliminary uh, stuff set up here. Let's continue. Now, I guess we're going to start working with uh, the API quite a bit here. Um, what I'll do is I'll create the method call, uh, or the callout rather, to our API endpoint, and then we'll start building our API files um, accordingly. So what we'll do is we're expecting to send a post request. That's what uh, OpenAI is expecting from us, a post request to their server, and we're going to be passing in either a text or image string value. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. Let me just write the code. So I'm going to say const, and this is going to be an API call. Const res is equal to uh, await fetch. Let me just close that out for now like that. Um, now you see we're getting an error message because await is basically part of an asynchronous callout. So what that means is that when we make this call and we send this um, API call to an external service, we're not expecting to get a response back right away. We're expecting an asynchronous communication between our application and the external application. So in order to do this in JavaScript uh, without errors, we need to come up here and we need to define an async keyword before our method, um, our parameter uh, declaration here. So we need to say async and then e. Um, and the reason why we're doing that is again, we want to specify that this callout will be treated in an asynchronous manner. So that means that the application can continue execution while awaiting the response from the external service. All right. Uh, so now we have the const res, and that's equal to await um, fetch. And in here, I'm just going to put some back ticks because we're going to uh, dynamically insert some values as part of our endpoint. So the endpoint that we ultimately want to call is the HTTP double four slash localhost port 3000 slash 
Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to call the API route because that's the, the API folder that we created slash dollar sign opening and closing parentheses. And in this parentheses, we're going to pass the form data dot content type. And I'll explain what, what I'm doing here in a sec. Um, you know what, let's go ahead and close that out with a comma and then opening and closing curly braces. Let me just stop there before we continue. Now you may be asking yourself, well, why are you passing in form data content type? Why are you doing that? Now it's simple. The reason why I'm doing that is because we're getting this value dynamically from the form submission. So this value would either be text or image, as you recall, uh, with the name attribute that's on the actual element, it could either be text or image. In this case, if we select text and then we submit the, the form, we're going to get back a string value of text. Hence, uh, right here in our folder structure in our API, if I go to app API, you guys can see that earlier we created a folder called text and image. These are basically going to be our endpoints. So when I, uh, when I select text as part of the uh, form submission, when I click the generate button, it's going to go to this text folder and look for the code within the route.js file, the, within the route handler that we set up. And, that's, and so this is better than just hard coding slash text um, and then whatever you know, uh, additional uh, data we need to pass. Um, because essentially, if we were to hard code this, then we would need to have two API callouts defined. But in this case, I'm just going to use one because I'm able to pass in this value dynamically. Hopefully that made sense to you guys. I try my best to explain. Um, but if that does not make sense, just kind of repeat this until it does. Like just put this video on repeat until it does. All right. Um, the next up, um, we open uh, this uh, curly brace here. Um, so within this block, what we want to do is specify a method. And what the server is expecting, what OpenAI is expecting, is us to send a post callout. So we're going to just say post like that. Even though we're retrieving information, we're using post because we have to send data. We have to send the API key as part of our request to uh, OpenAI so that way we can um, authenticate ourselves and access the data that we need. And then next up, we're going to pass some headers. So we're only essentially going to pass one header, and that's going to be our content type. Do not confuse this with our content type attribute here. This, this is totally separate. This is um, a part of a standard uh, convention when making outbound calls. So we're going to say content type like that, and that's going to be equal to application slash JSON because we're going to send a JSON um, object across the wire. All right. Uh, lastly, we're going to send a body. And this body, what we want to do is we want to send the form data. So we want to send the content type and the prompt um, that's part of our state. But in order to do that, we need to serialize that object. And to serialize it, we're going to use the JSON.stringify method. And then we're going to pass in the form data like that. So that's going to basically convert this into a string format, which is serialized data, pass that across the internet through an HTTP post request, and then OpenAI will receive that request and parse it accordingly, um, however they do that on their side. All right, so I think that's uh, everything we needed for this callout. Um, let's see. Um, do, 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 do. I guess what we can do next is we can go ahead and just kind of capture that response. So what we're going to do is say, we're just going to set results, and that's going to be equal to await res.json. And what this is basically doing is after we get back our, a response from the OpenAI server, we're going to render that down, down to JSON, and then we're going to uh, store that as our result uh, in our state. And the reason why we have the await here, again, is because this is an asynchronous call and we don't know exactly when that response may, may be returned. It may be instantaneously uh, and, it, and it may happen in five minutes. We don't know. So we need to specify a wait here in order to handle that accordingly. All right. And then lastly, we have, again, our set loading is false. So that will uh, automatically hide the loader. So I think that's it for our um, API callout.
I think that's it for that. Now we need to work with the actual API. So let's go to our um, let's go to our API folder here, and we have our text. And let's open up our route.js file. So now we get into the concepts of API. So basically, uh, in Next.js we have something called a route handler, and uh, the route handler in prior versions of Next.js, like twelve and and, and earlier we had API routes. So basically we would like have an, a, uh, an API folder uh, in our application and then we would have like um, uh, specifically named files, you know, for example, create a blog or something like that, create blog.js. And then we would just call the endpoint. We would say API slash create dash blog to call that endpoint. Well, what's changed in versions 13 and up, I'm using again 14, is that we have a route handler. So all we need to do now, and it's a far easier, all we need to do now is, is instead of uh, creating an asynchronous and anonymous function, we would come in here and we would create a folder of the endpoint uh, name. For example, in this case, we want to call API slash text as our endpoint. Um, so we would have a text folder. And within that folder, we would have this route.js file in which we would write our um, actual uh, API callout code. So let's go ahead and start working on that. This is the the, the best part of this uh, tutorial. So first, I'm going to bring in our Open AI, um, our Open AI reference, and remember that is coming from the file that we created earlier. So this is coming from the utils Open AI file. Next up from that file, we created uh, a couple of um, constant properties. I'm just going to bring in for this one our text model property. So I'm going to destruct that from this. So I think we're good there. The next thing I'm going to do here is in Next.js we have something called next response. So we're going to bring that in as you can see here. All right, cool. And that's going to be coming from next server. So this next response is going to be responsible for handling our API uh, response essentially and returning this to the caller. All right, next what we are going to do is, and this is what differs from earlier versions of next, we're going to create our function. So we're going to say export const because we're, we want to export the value from this file, export const function, and we're going to uh, create a method called post. Now it used to be that we would have again a method called create blog when we were using API routes, but in this case we're using route handlers, so we would actually use the method name as the the name of the function that we're going to call, and this function will take in the request from the page.jsx callout that we created just a few moments ago. So I'm going to open our code lock like this, and. The first thing I want to do is we need to have proper error handling here. So I'm going to create a try catch block. Say try catch error for error and cool. Let's go ahead first and let's handle our error. Um, so what could happen here is that um, when we make the API callout, it could happen that it's going to return uh, an error message that either like the service is down or you know, something happened uh, with our JSON, uh, our JSON could be corrupted, for example, anything could happen. So we need to be able to handle that scenario accordingly. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if the error object that's returned from the API callout has a response attribute. And the reason why is the OpenAI um, API, the GPT APIs, have usually like a, either a response object, sometimes it may have a different object like data, and stuff like that, we need to check to see if the error object has response because it would have helpful information in there that we can parse out and render to the page and to the user. So in this case, if the error has a response attribute, we just want to return a next response for the caller, which is the page.jsx file. And in here, actually we're going to say .json. We want to get the JSON that's returned as part of the uh, response. And then I'm going to open up some opening and cur uh, closing curly braces because we want to pass back an object. So that's going to be the error object, and that's going to be equal to error or error dot response. Because again, we're checking to see if response exists. Dot data dot I believe it's error. 
dot message. Right, quite a bit there. All right. So error dot response dot data dot error dot message. All right. And now, in addition to this, we can also pass an additional object that would represent the status code. So I'm going to say status because we may want to uh, specify um, custom status codes to handle things a certain way, like within our application. Um, so we can do that here. So we can say er dot response dot status. Let's make sure that's correct. Er dot response dot status. Cool. All right. All right, cool. So that should now um, handle a scenario if we have a response um, object as part of our error object. But what happens if we don't? So let's create an else here. So if we don't have that response, we also can get errors in some cases from the OpenAI API um, using a different uh, attribute. So we're going to return again a next response here response dot json and in this json let me just make sure i have semicolons here let me add one here sorry okay so in this json again uh, we're going to open this up and we're going to have another error object so in both cases we're going to be passing an error object to keep things consistent and it's going to be error dot message so that's just going to pass back a string with the error message and then we're going to open up another um, set of curly braces to be the second object and that's going to be status and the status here will be let's give it a 500 status so that's like a server um, internal server error and if you guys are wondering where this status code comes from if you go online or if you go on chat GPT itself and you look up HTTP status codes You'll see exactly how this works. Most of the, most of the experienced developers who are, who's watching this right now already know what this is. Uh, but if you're new or if you're you know you're not quite sure exactly what this means, just look it up online. You know you have 404, which is like uh, not found, or 401, which is unauthorized, I believe. Uh, you have the 302, which is a redirect, and then you have a 500, which is which is an internal server error. And these are important to specify as part of our code, so that way, you know, future developers, ourselves, or you know, even just a, a simple end user will know exactly what's going on when there's an error in, encountered in your application. So, just become a little bit familiar with uh, what these status codes mean. Um, all right, so with that being said, I think we're good there. I'm not sure what's happening up here. We're getting an error message. Uh, let's look in, into this. So uh, export const function. I am typing function correctly, right? Yes, I am. All right, let's see. I'm going to have a look into that shortly. Uh, it could be that because we have, we're not returning anything in the try block. Okay, so now I would say let's, let's go to work on our try block here. Um, Let's see, what do I want to do? Actually, I think I know what's going on here. So instead of cons, what we want to do is we don't want to say export cons. We want to say export async. And that's my fault, folks. Uh, we want to uh, say export async uh, because this code, again, this is part of our um, asynchronous call chain. So as you recall, before we had the async await on the caller, uh, the, the, the method that called this method. Um, so we also have to specify async here because we're making an asynchronous call out to the server. All right, so that's the reason why we were seeing that error message. Now, now it's gone. All right, so now let's work on the actual code that we need to run here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to pull the prompt out of the request that we're sending because as you recall, we're sending a prompt um, as part of our request, as part of our JSON body, uh, which was the form data. So let's pull the prompt out. Let's say const, and we're going to destruct prompt. And that's going to be equal to await again request dot JSON. All right. And again, we need await here because we don't know exactly when this uh, all of this will be returned. So we need to specify await. Otherwise, it won't work. You'll get an error message. All right. Um, the next thing we want to do is let's start building our API code code. So here we're expecting a response from the server. So we have to say const response here. And 
here's what we're going to call our open AI. We're going to use our open AI package. So we're going to say open AI dot create chat completion. All right. And we're going to open up a set of curly braces here and the semicolon at the end. So this uh, function create chat completion is all it's going to do is it's basically going to uh, take in uh, several parameters and then it's going to make the outbound call based on a role, some roles that we give it, and then it's going to return uh, some text output back to us. So the very first uh, parameter that we need to send here is a model, right? We need to specify which GPT model we'd like to use. And that, in this case, it's going to be GPT-4. So in that, it's being stored in our text model variable. So we're going to just say text model there. Next thing we're going to do is send a temperature. Now this one is optional. You don't have to send a temperature. I believe the default is 0 0.7 anyway. I'm going to set that to 0 0.8. And basically the closest it is to one, the more precise the output would be. The, if it's closer to zero, it would be more random, randomized output. So for example, if I type in as text, um, you know, um, something like uh, give me a funny joke as we demonstrated earlier, give me a funny joke about cats. If it's set to zero, uh, the temperature is set to zero, then the output could be very random. It could be a joke about cats. It could be a joke about dogs or anything that looks like a cat, like a lion or anything like that. Usually it's not so, so random like that. That may not be the best example, but what I wanna say is that if you specify a higher number, it will give you more precise results. Now the caveat to that is, or the, sort of the drawback to that is that um, if you use higher temperatures, you'll be also using more tokens. And behind the scenes, GPT or OpenAI uses tokens to render um, output. So, you know, I believe it's something like uh, for every thousand tokens is 750 characters, if I believe, I'm not sure. It's not a very easy equation to, uh, to understand. But essentially, um, if you're using higher temperatures and you're looking for more precise outputs or more closely related outputs, it's going to use a lot more processing power. That means you'll ultimately end up spending more money to run these requests. Like just me demonstrating this to you, I'm spending money for every request. It could be a, like anywhere from a few tenths of a cent of a penny anywhere to like a few cents per request. It depends on what you're trying to do. So it could really add up. So what I would suggest is while you're building this application, try your best not to run so many requests if you don't need to. Um, obviously in a production environment where you have customers, you may have like a SaaS product that you're charging uh, a monthly fee for so that way you can adequately profit from, from your application. So yeah, just wanted to throw that out there as food for thought. All right, so we have temperature here. I'll set that to zero point, you know, I'll set it to 0 0.7, all right? I think that's the default anyway, but it, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to show you that, um, that this is possible. And then we'll say messages, okay? Now the messages is relative to, I believe, I believe ChatGPT 3.5 and up, where you would actually specify here um, the types of uh, roles. And what you know, whatever, whatever, um, whatever information you would like to give the GPT in advance, I'll show you what I mean. This should be actually an array. So let's use the square brackets and open that up. And we're going to have the first object. So let's open up some curly braces within that. And we need to define a role for the actual system. Sorry. So that should be lowercase. And this is going to say role system. Now the system will be the GPT server. So we need to tell the GPT server what it needs to do. So I'm gonna say content for the next attribute. And here I'm gonna say, you are a content creation tool that generates text and images from user input. Yeah. Now you may be asking yourself, wow, you know, you typed plain English, you know, don't you have to use some sort of code? No, not necessarily. You know, AI is so smart that it totally understands this natural language. That's basically natural language processing. And it totally understands everything that you're giving it right now. Like, 
So the, just me writing in plain English like this, it'll totally understand what I want it to do. So this is basically um, an instruction to GPT to put itself in the shoes of being a content creation tool and give me back output that meets the user's needs. So now I'm going to create a second object, and this will also have a role, but this role will be the actual user that's using our tool. So let's say user here, and this content will be the prompt that we're passing in above, like that. <clears throat> so basically we're saying that this is coming from the user and run, listen to what the user is saying and run this prompt. All right, so I think, I think we're good there. Let's see. Now there are other attributes that you can define within this method call, but for the for the scope of this tutorial, we're not going to go deep into those. But you know, guys, let me know below in the comment section if there's something you want me to cover specific to AI here. Anything specific to you know the scope of what I'm teaching you guys here. Uh, just let me know that. And again, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, make sure you do so right now. Pause the video. Subscribe to this channel. Hit the bell icon to stay notified and give this video a like and share it, please. It really helps this channel so that I can continue creating content just like this. All right, let's, uh, let's continue. So next up, what we want to do, we're going to get back a response from the server after we make the code, uh, the call out. So first now, let's, um, do, 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 do. let's handle the response. So let's say const. We're going to get back text in this case. So we're going to just say text, and that's going to be equal to response. And then there will be a data object coming back from the server. And what's going on? So Response.data. All right. And then there will be a choices array. And the choices array <clears throat> would just be the, the uh, specific text. We're always going to want just the first index of that array. So the very first. Um, output coming as part of that list of um, choices. And we're going to say dot message. That's going to be another property there. And then I believe we're going to want the uh, content. Is it content? I think it is content. Dot content dot trim. We want to trim the results there. So to remove any additional uh, leading spaces or uh, trailing spaces afterwards. All right. Um, and then lastly, we need to do the same as we did before and return next response. And in this next response.json, we're going to open up these brackets. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's pass back a data object. And for the data object, we're going to just pass back the text and semicolon. And I think that should do it. I think that should do it for our first call out. I think that should. Let's let's uh let's go ahead and go to our browser. And as you guys can see here, we have the uh, here we already have everything we need uh, for the form on the left here. So we already got everything we need. Select a content type. If I select it, you see that uh, the styling is working. And you can see I'm I'm, I'm clicking the label and it's automatically highlighting. The correct radio button so that's working and obviously I can type in here as well that works perfectly all right now there's a few styles that's missing uh, guys like actually uh, yep that's working yeah the borders there yeah there's a few styles that's missing specifically with the output we're gonna have to work on the output um, area next all right so let's go back to uh, Visual Studio and um, let's see, what do we want to do now? Okay, I think we did this one. So let's go ahead and tackle uh, image next. So I'm thinking I can copy this entire file. I'm just going to copy. What we're going to do is we're just going to copy the entire file. And then I'm just going to paste it into the image one. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to look for route.js. But I'm going to make sure I'm selecting the one that says image. So that's in the image path, as you can see here. And I'm just going to paste that in. Now, obviously, we're, we're going to edit this code right now. So just bear with me. There's going to be a few things that we want to change here. So let's see. Um, the next thing I want to do is at the very top, but we'll go line by line here. Instead of using the text model, I'm going to use the image model. 
So let's just say image model, <clears throat> because again, we want to create images in this uh, endpoint. And then we, we have here the next response. We're going to leave that and we're going to have posts. Everything is the same up to now. We're going to pull out the prompt. So far, so good. All right. So now what we're going to do now in this case, I believe this code will be a lot simpler. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to get rid of, I'm just going to, you know what? I'm going to get rid of everything up to the return just before the return. So let's get rid of this stuff. We'll get rid of const response. So all that should be left here will be the prompt where we're destructing the prompt and then the return. We're going to write this all out again because this is going to be written differently because we're working now with the Dolly 3 API, which is the image generation API, which is pretty cool, pretty darn cool. I love it. Um, so let's go ahead and write this over here. So we're going to say const response again. And that's going to be equal to await. And we want to await the openAI.createImage function. And we're going to open that up and put a semicolon at the end like that. All right. This method uh, expects also a model, even though I think this is optional, but I'm going to pass it anyway because I want to use Dolly 3 instead of Dolly 2. So I'm going to say image model, comma, and then I'm going to pass in the prompt, which the user inputted in the text area field. Now, I don't have to do this. I don't have to say prompt is equal to prompt like this because my uh, JSON key or my object key in this case is the same as the name of the variable value I'm passing. I can just simply say prompt and then comma. So this it works the same way as you know prompt colon uh, prompt. So I'm just say prompt comma. It's a shorthand way of doing it. And then next will be n, and n will uh, specify the number of images to create. Now I'm working with Dolly three, and at the time of this video, it only allows us to generate one image at a time because it's, it uses a lot more processing power. Maybe by the time you guys get ready to do this, it'll probably allow a gazillion images. So for now, I'll just say one, okay? If you were working with Dolly 2, a common thing that people would do is they would specify like 4, 8, 12, whatever the case is, to generate 4, 8, and 12 uh, images respectively. Okay, so I think that's it for, for that. Um, yeah, we'll just leave that comma at the end like that. It's not necessary, but just in case we want to add more in the future, we can. All right, so I think that's it for that. Next, we need to handle the response. So we're gonna, in a response, we want to only get the image URL, right? We don't care about the other content. We just want the URL to the image from the server. And then from that point, the user can then like right click and then save image to computer and so on. So let's go ahead and grab the URL. So it's gonna be const image URLs. I'll just call it URL so that in the future, if we want to make it handle multiple um, images, we can. So it's say image URLs. Uh, actually, it won't be a wait. It will be response dot data dot data. This is really wicked here. Um, it'll be. I think it's like response dot data dot data. And what we need to do is because sometimes this the second data uh, comes back. Um, you know, sometimes null, we just need to specify this as a nullable type. So we'll use a question mark there. So data question mark dot map. And again, we're going to be just looping through each and every image. So we're going to say image here, arrow function. And what we want to get is the image dot URL. So that should return an array of URLs. Now, in this case, it will only be one, but it will be one image in an array. So the array will have a length of one, essentially. So we're going to need to handle that somewhere on the front end, okay? Um, or somewhere in the caller function. So let's go back to the caller. Let's go back to page.jsx because this file is should be done. In fact, let me just take a quick look here. I think in the in the um, in the error handling portion of this code, I think it would be the same because it would be like data.error. Yeah, so response.data.error.message. Uh, 
Yeah, I think this would be the same. The error handling would be the same. Yep. All right, so I think we're good here. Let's go back to page.jsx. All right, so in the page.jsx, again, so just to, to kind of reiterate here, we're calling this endpoint in our application, and we're passing in form data dot content type, which could either be text or image, which correspond to these folders here within the API folder. So this is a dynamic way for us to pass in that value. And based on whatever the user selects, whether text or image, we're going to call the respective uh, API endpoint and then pass in uh, this post request. We're going to pass in the API key, which we're getting from the open AI package uh, configuration that we declared, as well as the body. All right, so I think that should work. Um, I'm just trying to think, is there anything else we should do? I think this is ready to go. There is one more thing we'll need to do before we can test all of this. We need to finish our output function. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and let's open up our output by command P and then output. Now in the output, what we want to do is we want to make this this may take quite a bit of code, but what we want to do is we want to make things as clean as possible so that we can use this uh, to not only output text, but to output uh, images as well. So the first up, what I'll do is, I'm not sure why that's open. Let me just close that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the first thing we'll do here is I'm going to uh, define the use client directive above because we're going to have, we'll more than likely have some state uh, in this application. You know what? Maybe we won't have state, but I'm going to declare use client because there will be several things that will be loading, um, you know, like getting rendered at different uh, times of the application and not necessarily on page load. So I'm just going to declare this as a client side component using the use client. Now, um, the other thing we need to do here is we need to bring in our loading because we need to have our spinner display whenever we're loading. So we're going to say import loading, and that's going to come from the dot dot slash loading file that we created earlier. All right, so the let's go back to our page.jsx, because I want to show you where we're calling this output. So let's say output here. So what we're calling is, you guys can um, see here, we're, we're passing in three props. We're passing in content type, results, and loading. So we're passing that into our component. So we need to be able to handle those accordingly, right? So let's go back to output. Okay, and in output, let's see. I guess what I'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll do kind of similar to what we did before. We'll pass this in as props. So we'll just say props uh, uh, over here. <clears throat> but instead, I'm going to destruct these up here above our return. So we're going to say const curly braces, and we're going to destruct uh, these uh, props um, from the um, from the argument that we're passing in. So we're going to say content type, for example, comma, results, and I think the other one was loading, right? And it's going to be equal to props that we're passing in here above. So now we're destructing that, so that way we don't have to say props that content type. We could just say content type. You could do it either way. There's no right or wrong way. Some developers may argue against that, but hey. I'm a simple man. Um, all right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define a section here. Let's open that up. So we have this section, and then we're going to give this a class name. And this class name will be our output. So we're going to say output like that. And again, we've already styled this in our globals.css uh, file anyway, so we're good to go there. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to open up our set of curly braces because we want to um, pass in here or we want to, um, we essentially want to check if we have data in our results. Um, and if we do have data in our results, then we're, what we're going to do is we're going to output the, the actual uh, result. And if we don't, we want to output something else. So I'm going to say results. And that, again, that's being passed in above as part of our props, results.data. So if we have data, then we want to output something. So I'm just going to write this entire block. And this is how you write this in React in Next.js. You say results, question mark, dot data, question mark. This is like saying if else, 
uh, in other programming languages, including JavaScript. Uh, so we'll just open it up like that. I'm trying to think how many. So we're going to need to display. Let me see. Let me see if I can put some comments here. We're going to say here we're going to output results. All right. And then here, what we want to do is we also want to display uh, the spinner if, if the content is currently loading. So we're going to say loading, and again, question mark, and then the uh, braces, and hit enter. Let's get that a little bit nice. And here we're going to say show spinner. And then lastly, if all else fails, so basically if um, we don't have data and we're not currently loading, that means that the page is loaded, but there's nothing to display yet. So I'm just going to open up a set of curly braces, and this, will be, this is going to be our else block here. And actually, before we get to that, we also want to display the error message. So let me just kind of uh, come up here right behind this colon. Uh, because we want to display any potential errors. So I'm just going to add another leg here. I'm going to say results uh, question mark dot error. Um, and then we're going to have another question mark here. And then down here, we can open up this like that. So this right here will be show error. Just put some comments here to make things clear. And here we're going to say show default excuse me, I forgot my D, default message. All right, so that was quite a bit so far, but at least we have our logic uh, chain set up here. Now, the next thing we want to do is, let's go right back up to the top here. I guess the simplest thing to do here, or the, th the, the biggest chunk we can take care of here will be the, um, you know, if we have data, what do we want to show? So let's get rid of these, these comments here, and I'm going to create a section, All right? Should I create a section? What do you guys think? You know what? No, let's create a div, just a simple div. It doesn't really matter, but, you know, I, I generally use sections if I'm, you know, creating um, a cluster, if you will, of divs together. Uh, in this case, we're just going to keep things simple by using a basic div. Uh, so we'll have this div, and it will have a class. And how do I want to style this? Hmm. Let's give this a height of screen because now this will be the output window. It will stretch the entire height or length of the screen. Uh, not the width, but the length. Next up, we are going to, let's check to see what content type was selected. Okay, so we're gonna say, and again, this will get checked on form submissions. So we're gonna say content type, is equal if the content type is equal to text then we're going to do something let's take care of this part first so if this is equal to text first we're going to have a p tag and in that p tag we're going to output uh let's output results dot data all right and you know what, just because I'm OCD, I'll, I'll put a question mark. I really don't need the question mark, but I'm just going to keep it here just so you guys can know that this is a nullable type. It may or may not be returned. So we'll just say here, results question mark dot data. All right, so that should take care of that part. Now, what happens if it's an image, right? Because we need to be able to handle that. I'm, I'm having an error message here. What's going on here? It's because I haven't finished the, tra the trail, uh, the chain yet. Okay, then no worries. So now we're going to see if the content type is equal to image. So if it is equal to image, and let me just close this out like this because we'll need another trail. Okay, so if the content type is equal to image. Actually, you know what? We don't need an additional else here. So what I'm going to do, let's go back up here. I'm going to highlight everything. Uh, you know what? Let me just say. I'm going to delete everything up to the right behind image like that. And I'm just going to use a double and symbol or a double ampersand and then open up the, the curly braces like that. Not the curly braces, but the parentheses. <clears throat> because we don't need an additional. Um, we don't need an additional else statement after this. It can conclude after this. 
is either text or image. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So for this, I'm gonna create another div like this. And what do I want to do? Do I want styling here? Let's say W full. So class name equals W dash full. So we have the full. Um, this will, this will um, span the entire width of the container that it's in. <clears throat> so in this case, that will be the entire output window. And now we're gonna say results because what we want to do now is we want to output the data, the actual images. Now, if you guys recall, we did specify that we want just one image, but in the future, let's say we change that in attribute that's part of our API call to four instead of one. We had one before, if you guys recall. Well, instead of coming back here um, and just like adding additional code, um, we can just output it um, through a map, like through a map call, like kind of like what we did before where we uh, were working with the various um, uh, radio button options. We can actually use the map function to iterate through all the images. Now, obviously, we would only uh, loop through one image, uh, but still, if we make changes in the future, then we don't have to touch this code anymore. It's already done. So let's go ahead and loop through that. So I'm just thinking of what the best approach could be here. So what I'd like to do... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's say results... And I believe it's coming from the data. So results.data object, um, because there was a recent change, so things are a little bit confusing. But anyway, so we'll say results.data.map, right? <clears throat> and in this map, we're gonna have two attributes uh, or two properties that's being passed. So the first will be the image URL, and the next will be index. And this is going to be an arrow function, and we're going to open up a set of braces like that, or curly parentheses, uh, or just parentheses rather, curly parentheses. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to open up another div, slash div. There might be an error, that's why it's not auto-completing. And by the way, uh, by the way uh, if you guys are wondering how am I getting this auto-complete tag, there is a, an extension called auto, I think it's called auto-close tag. Uh, so you can install that in your Visual Studio code. I should have mentioned this earlier, but basically it allows me to automatically uh, close uh, div tags or any any tag for that matter instead of me having to type it out. It's just that in some cases, if there's like an error message or like some sort of like compile time error, then sometimes things don't, don't work. Uh, so you have to manually type out the, the closing tag in that case. But I think it should be fine. So. If you guys recall, maybe you've noticed that you're, you're, you're going to need a key here because we have an index and we're looping, we're using the map function, so we have to say index. We have to uh, make that a unique ID across the board. So we're going to put a key of index on this div, and then we're going to use an image tag, and it's going to be self-closing. And in this image tag, uh, for the source attribute, we're just going to pass it image URL like that and I guess we can give it an alt I don't know what to give it so I'll just say alt photo all right all right I think that's it for that for that um, <clears throat> excuse me leg of the code so now the next thing is what happens if it's loading right if we're in a loading phase what do we want to do well that's very simple we just want to display the loading component that we created and that's it for that one All right so that's going to show the spinner whenever we're loading some data and you'll see exactly how that works in a second all right so the next scenario is what if there's an error message right all right so uh, if there's an error message hmm, let's let's keep things simple let's just output a paragraph so we're going to say paragraph and we're gonna give it a class name, and the class name will be text. Let's make it rather large text, so we'll say text-xl, which is a uh, tailwind utility class, and then text red 800. I think, I think we this is good, 800, not 8,000, because that doesn't exist. All right, um, 
you know what, let's make it brighter than that. Let's make it 600 instead of 800. And in here, in the parentheses, or rather in the curly braces, I'm gonna say results.error. Because remember, this error object is getting passed. If I were to go to, let's say if I go to my route JS of text, <clears throat> and if you guys look in here somewhere, as you can see here in the bottom, we're returning this error object. We, we declare this ourselves. So this is what we're returning from the API callout. That's why we have to say results that error. Okay. So let's go back to our page.jsx. Actually, we were in, sorry, in our output.jsx. Cool. So we took care of that. Um, and then lastly, if there is nothing, like if, you know, if all else fails, we're just going to output a default message. <clears throat> so the default message we want to output, let's say, please select a content type. And let's see, what do we want to do? We want to give that a class name of text-xl and save. All right. So I think that does it, folks. Um, Let's go to our front end and see how that looks. Now, <clears throat> one thing I'll say also is, yeah, this looks really good. Uh, as you can see here, we have our uh, text um, being outputted directly in the center of the component. And now we also have our heading up top and we have our form on the side here. The only thing is, the only thing that's left to do is we're just going to need to test this and there may be some errors. Let me just do a, a, a fresh refresh here. If you guys are wondering, so to those who don't really know Next.js or React, if you're wondering, well, how did everything automatically update in the, in the application as soon as I saved uh, my changes, it's because there's a concept called hot reloading in uh, Next.js. So every time you make a change and you save, the browser will automatically update uh, for you. So that's pretty neat. All right, uh, let's give this a test. I'm expecting some error messages. so. Um, I'm going, maybe if we're lucky, we will get no error messages, but, uh, so let's select a type. Let's say text first and let's create some text. Let's say, um, come up with the next Harry Potter. Uh, maybe let's say, come up with the next Harry Potter movie script. Make this one the best one yet all right maybe not the best example to use but you know i do like harry potter so let's go ahead and click create or generate and if you guys noticed um it actually uh switched to disabled i was not able to click this button again so that's part of our styling that's neat so we're getting an error message here so th that's working so cannot read property of undefined so trying to read choices okay Let's go back to our code and see what's going on here. All right, so the choices, if you guys recall, was in that text route. Let's go to route.js of text. And let's look for, let's do a command F to look for choices. All right, so down here. So it's saying that <clears throat> it cannot uh, read choices. Hmm. Let's see. Um, one thing I'm, uh, we may need to do here is we may need to output the results here, but let me, let's do that. Let's go ahead and let's add a, uh, right down here, right above this, let's add a console.log so we can just output this. We're just going to say data like that, comma, response dot uh, data, right? response that data okay let's go back to here and what we're going to do is we're going to open up our inspect with this right click and uh, select inspect so we can look at our browsers inspect um, tools and let's click on the console tab and you guys can see that there is an error message here but this error message doesn't always pertain to what we're seeing so this one says extra attributes this is a common next.js message this can happen if you're if you have additional like browser plugins installed, like extensions or something like that. It can also happen if um, the HTML markup differs on the client side than it does on the server side. 
Um, this is more of a warning. It's not really an error. Um, so I would just ignore it. But, you know, you can try to fix it if you want. I'm not going to do it for this video. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here. and I'm going to type clear, uh, um, opening and closing parentheses, and hit enter, and that will clear out my output. Now let's try this again and see if we get it, um, some more information. So I'm going to click generate again. And as you can see, we have this error message here now. So if I click on this link, it should take me to the networking tab, <clears throat> and it does. And we see we have a 500 error. So if I open this up, this may give me an example. Uh, and if I can't figure this out, I'll, I'll definitely pause this video and come back to you guys with the solution. Uh, but let's take a quick look here together to see. So right here is where we're calling the API. So we're saying slash API slash text, that seems correct, all right? And then here is where we're passing in the payload. So we're passing in text and then the actual uh, prompt that we, the instructions. Um, and then if I click on response, we're getting back this. Now, and this is not the response from the actual server, guys. This is actually, uh, the response from um, uh, the, from our application, from our side. This is not coming back from OpenAI server, okay? So let's see here. Now I noticed it did not output, uh, it didn't output my, um, my console.log. So let's go back here real quick. So obviously there's an error message happening before this somewhere. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and pause this video right now, and I'm going to come back to you guys once I find out the solution. All right, guys, so I troubleshot this uh, problem a bit further, and I found a few things. So let's look at our code a, a little bit here. So let's go back to our Visual Studio code. And in here, um, a few things. So the first thing here is uh, we are outputting in this console.log the response.data. The reason why I did not see that in our browser is because um, we're running this on the server side. Remember, once we're making that initial API callout to our um, route handler in Next.js, now we're trying to make a callout from that route handler to open AI on, on essentially from the server side. So the, essentially the browser will not see that value. But however, if I switch back here, you'll see that um, somewhere here, down here, for instance, you see that data is outputting, but um, it's outputting as undefined. So, you know, just keep in mind that whatever is in this route handler, you need to check the terminal or the, or the uh, command line for the output, not the browser. I wanted to, to say that. So now that I know that, so let's go ahead and remove this console.log because that's not the problem. The real problem here is if we scroll back up, to the top of this method call, to this outbound call, on line number nine here of my window, we have this const response uh, is equal to open AI. Because this is an asynchronous callout, we need to specify await here. Because remember, we, this is an asynchronous callout, so we have to say await and then whatever we're calling. Now this open AI, again, this open AI package will handle all of the um, outbound method calls for you. So we don't have to explicitly call the endpoints ourselves. This create chat completion is wired up to a specific endpoint on the OpenAI uh, API uh, server. So that should be good. Let's just see if that fixes the problem. So I added a wait here. Let's go back to this. And um, you know what? Let me just let me just quickly, I just want to give this a, a new refresh here. I'll just copy the text. I'll refresh it. And I'm going to select text again and I'm going to paste it in and let's go to generate and now we see the please wait and it looks like that's working because it's it's working pretty hard to find our results so let me just go here ah there's something we forgot to do guys you see this spinner is not spinning but anyway this is this is our result here so we have a story um, and yeah Oh, actually, it says, sorry, I cannot generate a script. But either way, this is working because this is ChatGPT's response. Let's try something else. Let's try, um, okay, we, we, we could try a, a joke again. So let's say, um, uh, tell me a funny joke about chickens. All 
right? So let's try that again, generate. And there we go, we have our joke here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty funny, I think so. It's funny that AI is so humorous, but uh, anyway, yeah. So yeah, that's working. Now there's one thing we need to fix here with the styling. So let's go back to our Visual Studio Code. And let's see here. What we wanna do is we wanna open up our globals.css because what we haven't done yet, if I scroll down to the bottom here, we define our spinner um, styles, but what we haven't defined yet is our keyframes. And we need the keyframes um, annotation here so that way we can um, actually show the animation take place when we are clicking loading. So let's go back here um, to that and let's go down here and we're gonna say at keyframes. Right at keyframes. I hope I spelled that correct. Yep, keyframes, and then spin because we're do, we're gonna have a spin animation, right? And that that's basically referencing the uh, spin animation attribute or value rather that we specified above. So now we're gonna say two, and open up another block here, and so we're gonna say transform. I think that's what it is. It's not transition. It's transform and rotate. And we're, we're going to rotate this uh, 360 degrees. So it's going to be rotate of 360DEG. Okay, that should do the trick for the animation. So we basically want to rotate this 360 degrees based on the keyframes uh, value that we're setting here. Um, cool. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go back to our page.jsx file because I don't wanna have to submit another request and keep to, to keep testing this. So let's go there and I think we have this, um, let's see, loading. Where is, so where are we doing that? Actually, it's in the output. Let's go to output.jsx and I think we have colon loading, yeah. So what we're gonna do here is I'm just gonna put a an exclamation mark here. So if we're not loading, so this should automatically output. Uh, let me just refresh the page. Is that gonna work? Yes. So now you see here we have our loader, but it's not quite still where I want it to be. So the loader is working, uh, but I need to fix some styling issues here because this is not exactly what I want it to be. All right, uh, so let's try to figure out how we can fix that. So huh. what we want to do is we want to have this loader directly in the center, okay? So we want this to be directly in the center. And I think, I'm just looking here at some references. All right, so let's go back to our globals.css. Let's look at our code here. The spinner layer okay let me try to add this in uh, let's see if we have something here that we uh, that we defined loader I think it's because I'm forgetting flex I think it's because I'm forgetting flex here let's try that so let's say flex here and go back. Okay, so yeah, that looks a, a lot better, but it's still not vertically uh, centered. So let's see, if I go back to here, okay, this loader tailwind, okay. All right, so what we can do, actually I think we're missing item center. So let's add that in items dash center and save. And if I go back, now it's uh, vertically and horizontally centered to the page. That's wonderful. All right, so that's looking good. All right, so now we can go back to our other uh, output component. Let's go to output, and now back here, we can take get rid of that um, uh, exclamation mark there. All right, and now we have our default message back. All right, so let's test this finally. Let's test the text again. So we're going to say, uh, this time let's just say something like um, 
tell me the capital of Kenya. Something nice and simple. So now I click generate and now it says the capital of Kenya is Nairobi. Perfect. So this is working as expected. So text text works perfectly. Now, if you guys also notice when I click generate, again, the button de disabled and then it was like a different color. It was it changed to a gray color. And then at that time, I was not allowed or able to click the button again to resubmit the request. So that's working as well. That's wonderful. And finally, let's, let's try images. The bread and butter here. So um, we're going to clear out this here. Uh, let's enter a brief description. So um, let's say an image of a car flying over the moon. So just something wonky and crazy. Let's generate. And let's see if we get back an image. Now this may take quite a bit of time because obviously it's using a lot more tokens and power to generate an image, an AI image. Okay, it looks like we have an error message here. So text is not defined. So let's go back to our, our application here and find out what happened. So text is not defined, huh? Text. So we would, let's, let's first try to go to our routes.js of image and we'll do some reverse engineering there. So text, yeah, now that's because we copied this, um, we copied this code from the other class. So we, we don't want text here. As you can see here on, on line 16, we're trying to return text and that's not defined obviously. So what we need to do is instead of returning text, we need to return image URL or image URLs rather, all right? And that should fix that problem. So let's go back to our a front end here and let's resubmit this. Let's give it a sec. All right. Boom, there it is. Wow, that's that's a crazy image. <laughs> Uh, it's not necessarily flying over the moon, but you know, what's interesting also is if you were to resubmit this, it's going to give you another image. So let's try that. Let's try generate again. Just give it a few seconds. It should give us a different image. Yes, it does. As you can see, this image is far, uh, vastly different than the prior image. So guys, that's pretty much it. I mean, this is uh, your AI content generator. You can poke around at this, have fun. It's sort of working as a ChatGPT clone and a Dolly 3 clone, if you will. You know, definitely play around with this, you know, make things happen. You could probably think of other great ideas. And while we're at it, I've actually built a, an even more advanced tool based on this. So if we uh, go to our browser and type in Lavexa, Dot com that's l e v e x a dot com and I can put this in the video description. If you go to Lavexa, this is actually my website, and I've actually built this um, using ChatGPT, um, actually using ChatGPT um, three point five Turbo to return things faster. So let me just show you some of the tools that we have here. So this is, uh, as you can see, an AI powered um, SaaS product. So if I go here and I click on View All Tools. You see, I have several tools here. I have tools that can generate essays, tools that can generate images, as you can see, uh, paragraph writers, and so on. So guys, this is a, a paid tool, but it's very inexpensive. So feel free to sign up for this if you guys want to have access to create blog content, uh, create essays for you know, you know, know, non-academic and academic purposes. It can, it can actually help you write essays faster. Uh, I wouldn't suggest using it to write your entire essay, but rather use it as sort of a reference point to write better essays. Um, I also have here, um, you know, paraphraser, paraphrasing tools. So a tool that you can use to you input um, some text and then it will output um, the text written in a different way. So very helpful. And as you can see, if I go to pricing here, uh, this is our pricing. So. You know, very inexpensive. You can get signed up for a $1 free trial or not free trial, but a $1 trial 
for seven days. Uh, you can also sign up for a $39 plan, which gives you access to all the tools. So, um, you know, this is great, um, you know, great bargain. And, you know, definitely check it out. That's once again, L-E-V-E-X-A.com. And guys, I mean, that pretty much concludes this tutorial and crash course on OpenAI, ChatGPT APIs, as well as the DALI-E3 um, API. You know, again, make sure you subscribe to this channel for future videos. We, we try to cover all different types of topics. We don't believe in pigeonholing ourselves into just one tech stack. We want to show the, the, the various uh, features of various tech stacks around the world. And so, you know, feel free to subscribe to this channel, you know, like this video and share it with the developer community. And until next time, guys, happy coding.